Anyone who isn't dead or from another plane of existence would do well to cover their ears right about now. Cinema Psyops. My personal view is that it's nauseating, disgusting, degrading, ghastly, skinny, truly unrealistic, and generally nauseating. They are unbelievably nauseating. They are the antithesis of humankind. I regard them as disgusting, nasty, horrible, without any kind of merit. I just do not believe that any allegedly cultural activity which strikes at the roots of culture is to be applauded. They represent nothing, to my mind, enduring, decent, or worthwhile. I just do not believe that they contribute anything worthwhile to inflict themselves upon society at large. I would like to see somebody Cinema Psyops with Hort and Matt. Hey, Pally. What do you mean I'm not in this movie? I don't care if I'm dead. You could have propped up my corpse with a board or something and paid me. I'll take 75% to 85% of the budget like I always do. As a matter of fact, I'll even supply a backup me. How you doing, me? Hey, Pally. We can weaken it, Bernie's it. <laughs> put on a pair of sunglasses on me. Just put on some strings. With some of that uh, Caribbean music that you play, maybe you could get my corpse walking around like uh, Weekend at Bernie's too. Yes. Back in the city. <laughs> <laughs> oh, back in the city. Uh, like today. <laughs> yeah. So is Bruce Willis doing his own Charles Bronson impersonation in this film? No. Or is he making the character his own? He's made, He did. He made the character his own, I I would say. And I don't okay. go through that. But um, I'll say this, because he plays... Uh, at first, it was like annoying me. I'm like, what the fuck is Bruce Willis doing? And then I realized he's trying to play a very soft, non-violent man. Yeah. It, it, and but, Bruce Willis can't do that. He can't pull that off at all, because Bruce... There's nothing soft or non-violent about Bruce Willis. Yeah. I mean, he kind of pulled it off, but not really for me in uh, Unbreakable where he was yeah. that. But the thing about Bruce Willis is he just is always menacing. He's men it's Bruce Willis has a look of simmering anger. Yeah. Like almost like a volcano that keeps bubbling. You're like, God, someday it's just going to go off and murder everybody. He reminds me of my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hug the TV a lot? My Ask dad's still around. Why uh, would I hug the TV? That's not uh, how it works. Well, but your dad's not here either. So, <laughs> I mean, what in Omaha? Yeah, it's probably for the best. Oh Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> I thought Bruce Willis did his best at trying to seem very nonviolent. Probably direction of the director and all that kind of shit. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I thought he did his best. But yeah, Bruce Willis can't because even in Unbreakable, where he's just kind of your normal nine to fiver family man, you you can at least be because he does you know he, he's lower income family in that he can at least play kind of like the downtrodden where, you know, every downtrodden person has a simmer of anger there uh -huh. that they don't have a better situation. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get too deep into his performance because we're going to be digging into it quite a bit. Yeah. But we kind of hinted at this and we kind of said it at the beginning where people were kind of all up in arms about this because it being basically a reimagining, remake, reinterpretation of the book or whatever the fuck it's supposed yeah. to be. It still doesn't go anywhere near the book like the other original Death Wish series never did. Uh, there's Okay, so this all started from a book? Yeah, there's a Death Wish book. Okay. And then the sequel to that was, which we've already done, the that movie was, Death Sentence. That was uh, Kevin Bacon's yeah, uh, movie. But the Death Sentence movie, just like the Death Wish movies, yeah. didn't follow the book. Uh, I it gotcha. just took the general idea of man gets family murdered yeah. or family gets murdered while man's out doing some man things. Yeah. And man comes and gets revenge and or, you know, whatever. But yeah. in the book, he never he never catches the people who does it. He never goes out and gets the guys to kill yeah. his uh, wife. None of that ever happened. Well, uh, I mean, at least in the first first death wish they did that you know where he didn't actually catch any of those guys you right know? right he just was killing yeah you know other muggers right and it's more about yeah. trying to make yourself feel better while now, you become a serial killer the, of mur muggers the death sentence book was that also about paul kersey or was it about a different guy yes it's technically a sequel oh, okay and it's the writer's reaction to how death wish the movie came out and how it was handled and uh, his disapproval of it so it wasn't um so in debt the death sentence movie they even changed the character name.
names then because Kevin Bacon wasn't Paul Kersey. No, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they changed the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah they, all the names and right. everything. I yeah. think they just bought the rights so that they could get a Death Wish movie without actually making a Death Wish movie. Well, and this Death Wish remake awfully reminds me of Death Sentence yeah, as I watched the whole real fucking thing. fucking close to Death I mean, Sentence, oh, yeah. The same kind of everything involved in this was like, I was like, am I watching Death Sentence again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like going through everything. Holy fuck. Well, there, there's a good reason for that because the author of the books, as far as I understand it, and uh-huh. if I remember correctly, and I'm sure I'll get corrected if I'm wrong. Yes. Yeah. Someone out there in the potosphere will get after me. Yeah, and they'll be like, God damn, Court, why are you so stupid? Yeah, something like that. But uh, as far as I understand, Death Sentence was a direct response to how much the Death Wish movie was pro-gun and pro-fascist and pro-right wing. Uh-huh. And the author did not like that at all. Oh, really? So he made the Death Sentence book, apparently, ultra-left and really about like guns. Guns are bad. Right. And if you really think about it, the movie Death Sentence that was made from that, it feels like they took that over at they, least into they the did. movie. Because, I mean, guns were the whole... Yeah. Fucking, now, the, the speech ori- that John original- Goodman's character gives about some motherfucker wants to kill some motherfucker for killing some motherfucker. Y- y- yeah. Yeah. God, fuck it. John Goodman's good in everything. <laughs> yeah, he really is. I mean, Jesus, he almost makes the Flintstones worth watching. Right. But, almost. <laughs> almost, yeah. But the big thing that we're getting back here, and we have to circle back around. Yeah. Circle the wagons again. Circle the wagons, everyone. Okay. Huddle uh, up, motherfucker. <laughs> all right. People, whenever this was announced, were like, oh my gosh, Bruce Willis has just given up. He's a washed up, hammy actor. Why did they hire him? Yeah. Uh, perfect for a Death Wish series. Yes. Because Bronson had been pretty much given up on his career at this point and was mm-hmm. doing paycheck movies. Just, yeah. Just like Robert De Niro. Exactly. I fucking love Bronson, and I really do enjoy Death Wish 3, and I there's parts of the other movies that I do legitimately like. Yeah. But at this point in his career... He was going for a paycheck. Yeah. He didn't give a fuck. I mean, why else would he do those kind of movies? He did a bunch of canon films like that. There, there, there are many different career paths actors can take. Like some, they start out in the indie scene, like making like passion projects, and then later on, much like De Niro, then they go for paycheck movies. Like De Niro started going passion project and then he went after big money and then there are some who start in action and get all their big money early and then later on once they have all their money then they start doing passion projects to you know because they're already funded so then they could do things they're actually interested in and then there's the bruce willis way where he starts off on tv ends up in action films dips into passion projects then delves back into action action films films to try and make a paycheck and pay off his whatever he has to pay uh, it's so hard to look at today's bruce willis and realize that he was a dashy leading man in Moonlighting. It's really hard to look at today's Bruce Willis and realize he was once a really good fucking actor. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. Like, really good. Because a lot of the last few things that I've seen him in, including this remake, uh, he doesn't, it's not even him. It's like, yeah. he has one mode that he switches on and he's just like quiet talk Bruce Willis, just standing there on screen and deal with it. I remember he used to, like, like diehard Bruce Willis when he's yelling, oh, yeah. hi, you're welcome to the party, pal. You know, yeah. I can't see today's Bruce Willis. Yippee Kaye, yeah, motherfucker. Yeah, Yippee Kaye, all that shit. I can't like like the scene where he's in the um the air draft with the or the vents yeah. with the lighter. Hey, come, come on, on to the coast. We'll have, have a good a couple, time. Have yeah. a couple drinks. I can't see today's Bruce Willis being that funny or dashied or you know that that happy go lucky. You still character. see it. There's there's parts of it where a director, yeah. a good director, can pull that kind of stuff out of him. Yeah, but most people are intimidated by him because he is fucking Bruce he, Willis. He has that once yeah. again that simmering rage behind his eyes. Yeah. I, I can intimidated by him and I'm watching him on a screen I know he's nowhere near me but I'm afraid talking about him right now he might be right the fuck behind me <laughs> and he does play Psycho really fucking well yes because he's probably not playing <laughs> <laughs> um, while we check every corner of the fucking studio now that we've talked shit about Bruce Willis to make sure he's not waiting to kill us I'm very scared right now <laughs> we're gonna take a break we'll play a promo <laughs> from another podcast we'll have a little bit of music that's befitting of the Death Wish remake yeah and when we come back we will have the trailer Prepare for a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Hear your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not-so-classic monster movie. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price and Joel Hodgson. Listen to the discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the head of Rondo Hatton. Oh 
only on Monster Kids Radio. Radio. Oh, no, I would be honored to be able to growl like that. That is fucking Chris Barnes, formerly of Cannibal Corpse, and that is six feet under covering back and black. That's awesome, but everyone who's ever seen Corpse Picture knows this. He looks like he can nail that voice. Uh, I'm just saying. I did a pretty decent death metal growl. Oh, you've yeah, heard me do it. I just heard your death yeah. metal growl. That's why I said. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds very much like you. Yeah, I do. But, okay. man, was that shocking? Because I'm hearing the whole rift coming yeah. into the song, and I'm like, oh, we're playing ACDC. Makes sense. I mean, that was... But this must be a live was, version. It sounds yeah, slightly yeah, different. Yeah, slightly yeah. Different, but yeah. not too different. And then I was like, and I'm like, holy shit! Back in black. <laughs> what the fuck? The I was like, holy shit! It was a log about to be back. That is true. Once this movie started, I heard ACD yeah. the first time. I went, what the fuck is this? Iron Man? What am I watching here? Yeah, I, I, I get the idea that Back in Black, but it's yeah. a, Back in Black's about a dude who gets out of prison and resumes his career in, you know, yeah. criminality. That has well, nothing to do with Paul Kersey other than Paul the fact K- that he's dealing with criminality. <laughs> I mean, he is kind of a criminal. You know but- what would have been perfect dirty deeds done dirt cheap yeah that would have been perfect for this movie. dirt cheap that's yeah. right but they really loved acdc's back in black so much though it's even in this trailer hey sway in the morning say four five we got to talk about what's happening in chicago hey. everybody's watching this viral video this guy in the hoodie they're calling the grim reaper he stopped the carjacking is he right for taking the law into his own hands he's become a folk hero what about the shooter you look like a white dude Hi, one, one. What is your emergency? There's men. They're breaking into my house. I think they're here. <gasps> no. I failed to protect them. Dad, where's mom? The men who did it are out there. So there's nothing that you can do. Is that what you're saying? If a man really wants to protect what's his, I want to buy a gun. He has to do it for himself. We're closed, pal. <laughs> we'll kill my wife. Who else was there? I don't know anything else. I believe you, Joe. So you're not gonna kill me? No, Jack is. You got caught in some crossfire? The ice cream man done it. The ice cream man? Can't walk to school if they don't work for him. Who are you? Your last customer. You're not a cop! Somebody has to do it! Stop the news! You're cocked, locked, and ready to work. I'll say. They called him a guardian angel. He saved my life. You look much better getting out, socializing. Mm. Not so much. Well, whatever you're doing, keep it up. <laughs> okay, I will. So that's the movie. There's a review. I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs> Holy fuck. Thanks for taking every fucking clip I have and shoving it in the goddamn preview. That trailer is mega spoilery. Yeah. Mega spoilery. I mean, it's fucking done, man. Yeah. Like, Dad, where's mom? Dad, where's mom? It gives you everything. It takes everything. away every little bit of like everything. fucking suspense that this movie would have. <laughs> I mean, the best, most badass lines that they put it in there. I mean, fuck movie trailers, man. We get it, movie. You got Bruce Willis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we get it. Oh my god, that fucking How about sucks. showing us some of the other amazing actors that you have in yeah, your trailer, right? you know? I mean, Jesus. <laughs>
Yeah. I guess they did show Vincent D'Onofrio, so. Yeah, but only slightly. Yeah. Now, how fucking amazing would a Death Wish movie with Vincent D'Onofrio have been? Be fucking insane. If he was the fucking uh, uh, lead? Yeah, oh my God. If he was Paul Kersey? Yeah. Oh, it'd be insane. Because, like, even when he's in a movie like this, he still gives his all. He, he never not delivers. He and the lead detective stole this movie, Detective Reigns. Yeah, and I yeah. love that guy, I too. I love that guy. I, I can't remember I, his name yeah, off the top I of my that head. his name pulled up, but all throughout the movie, I fucking love him. And he plays a lot different. Like, he plays a cross train character because he does play the grumpy cop a little bit. Like, we were kind of used to seeing him, especially in um, in uh, Breaking, Bad. Breaking Bad. Dean Norris is the Dean actor's no- name. And, and he plays a grumpy cop in a lot of things, not just Breaking Bad. But here he also plays, like, this hopeful grumpy cop. Yeah. Like, he's, like, telling everyone, you know, have faith. We're going to really find these people. And- he's grumpy because he's on a diet. Too, yes. The is- only reason he's grumpy is because he's on a diet. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. He's not, like, grumpy from years of seeing death and shit. Like, like his other characters. He's just grumpy because he's on a diet. Everybody, everything else when he's talking to victims, he's like, oh, just keep hope. It's going to be great. And it sounds weird coming from that gruff fucking voice saying that. Have you seen the TV show Claws about the ladies who do the acrylic nail things? They have, have a nail salon, yet. but they're involved in organized crime. I see he's in it. I've never yeah, seen it. He plays like a crime lord from the Dixie Mafia named Uncle Daddy is the, the name Uncle that he Daddy? goes by. Uh-huh. He is a bisexual weirdo. <laughs> That's awesome. The fact that he's bisexual has nothing to do with the fact that he's a fucking weirdo. weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> like, those two are mutually yeah, exclusive with his character. Can be, yeah. yeah. Oh my god, he is amazing. It's, like, really cool to see Dean Norris just reaching out in yeah, that show. Doing something yeah. different. That's awesome. The show is, like, equal to parts amazing and frustrating at the same time for yeah. me because it does this weird stuff to it that I'm like, just be a normal show. Just show just, me just, just show me the fucking criminality dude, and dude, the organized no, crime. It's, What's with this, like, five-minute music sequence where this couple's breaking up and they're singing about it? Why yeah. are you doing this show. It's weird for me to see the cop lady from Reno 911 play a serious role instead of comedy one. <laughs> she is amazing. Uh, but I mean, yeah. I don't doubt that because I love her. Wait, in Nisi? Uh, I can't yeah. remember her. Nisi something. I can't yeah. remember her last name. But she was great in Reno 911. She was one of the best things. Oh, yeah. I absolutely loved her in Scream Queens. Like, I developed yes. a huge crush for her on Scream Queens. Uh, 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 my wife would have me uh, had me sit down one night. She goes, I think you really will like this. It's called Scream Queen. Yeah. And I watched one episode and I'm like, fuck, binge all the time. This yeah. is fucking hilarious. Yeah. I'm loving every yeah. minute of this. I also have a huge crush on Chad Radwell. <laughs> like, I have an unhealthy love of that man. I've watched things just because that actor's in it. I love how we're not talking about the movie, the movie at all. Yeah. No, the, 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 the lead kind of uh, mean girl actress in... Uh, in uh, Emma Roberts. Anna Roberts, yes. Emma Roberts. Emma, Emma, Emma Roberts. I, yeah. Eric Roberts' daughter, by yes, the way. Yes, I fell in love with her in her abilities when I watched her in American Horror Story. The yeah. first time I ever yeah. saw her in that I thought she played a really awesome kind of character and she played just a great character in this too I'm like god damn you know she's got some chops on her she can act I loved her in Scream Queens I'm not yeah. a huge fan of the coven season that she was first debuted in okay um, I, but as maybe not that I like her ability to act in it oh no she's good yeah, yeah. yeah. alright speaking of an ability to act or lack thereof ability to act being Vincent uh, D'Onofrio lack thereof being Bruce Willis in this movie hey Court yeah. I heard you were talking about me and my ability to act hey Matt I heard you're doing an impression of me I don't like it. Court, I heard you and Matt were doing impressions of me, and I don't like it. <laughs> well, Meta Willis, I can't handle this. <laughs> Do the review. We just hit like eight times the Willis. <laughs> there you All go, right. folks. Eight times Willis. Eight times Willis. All right. It's Death Wish Redo. Electric Boogaloo. Let's do it. <laughs> really? I, I don't know. Back in the city. Yes. Back in the city. <laughs> Death, Wish, Death Wish Redo. Electric Boogaloo. Back in the city. Where we're all going to save that rec center with <laughs> violence and blood. All right. So. <laughs> the rec center being your daughter. We begin the movie uh, with an opening montage with some news and 911 calls. And because I'm a shitty person. Person for doing podcasting. That's our first clip. 911, what is your emergency? I just shot my brother. Help me. The girl is now recovering from a shooting on the Breaking far side. Breaking news. Two teens, the victims of deadly gunfire on Chicago. Chicago will end 2016 with a surging murder rate as city leaders struggle the morning, to find... Five. We gotta talk about what's happening in Chicago. You got Taylor better on the line right now, man. You wanna know what the problem is? The problem is they don't care about us. The problem is we don't got enough education. A year-old boy who was shot and killed by a year old girl Jeffrey. recovering from gunshot who suffered in a shooting last night. 762 murders, more than 35 we gonna keep this topic going because something has to give in Chicago. Emergency. Emergency. Shots fired at the police. We have an officer down. Come in for 
south loop. We're on Wacker Avenue. We're heading towards Chicago North. See you in about two minutes. All right, so we are now in Chicago, uh, so that's where this movie will now take place. Um, I think the book took place in Chicago, but I'm not oh, 100% did it? sure. So in New York? I, Just in the 80s, New York was probably more of a cesspool than Chicago. If one or the other. I can't remember yeah. which way it actually now, ended up in the book. But. Now it seems New York is the less violent town and more touristy. The violent town is Chicago nowadays, so I guess it makes sense. Yeah, well, that's where a lot of the shootings were happening at the time that the movie was made, and it's cashing in on that yeah. sensationalism to get news titles. Big time. Like, how dare they make this movie in this climate yeah. take place in a fucking town that has this level of violence. Isn't it weird how it always changes though? Like I still, I still always remember like in the 80s as a kid whenever I thought of New York City I thought like it's like a demilitarized zone. It's fucking just lawless and now in it's like a fucking In the 80s as a kid trap. I thought every town that was like you know had like a like, building that was over 12 stories yeah, was, was gonna be like that. <laughs> <laughs> well anyway a cop has been shot and we get into the emergency room um, and they uh, tell them to get Dr. Kirsten the solid opening for the film, by the way. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I didn't even mean that. Oh. But now that you're going to take it that way, sure, I meant it that oh, way. Oh, <laughs> it's gross. Anyway, um, Dr. Kersey tries to help, but the cop is dead. He basically gets his gloves on, orders yep. what he needs to save the, the guy's life, lights. and then the guy just, brr, done. Yep. Um, so then, as Kersey goes out, he's giving the bad news to the cop partner, and then he gets word that the shooter is also in there, and he needs surgery. So as Kersey goes, he, uh, the cop makes it like a, a comment he goes hey, so you're just gonna save the animal that shot him and and, and Kersey just says I'm gonna try but it sounds good try I'm gonna try actually this is how he begins acting guys uh, the uh, is gone right now it's not there it, he, but he it kind of there but he tries to lighten it up uh, I'm gonna tr uh, try <laughs> <laughs> he talks really lightly if anybody watches this flick with us and you'll hear it sometimes in some of the clips where I he tries had to, to normalize be, it just to try and get it to where you could hear what the fuck he's saying in because the he, he tries to talk so softly to be this anti-violent character, Paul Kersey, you know, uh, <laughs> who does have like a violent bone in his body, apparently. Or he does, but he suppresses it. Yeah, that, that's the key. Because, this yeah, particular Paul Kersey does have that. He's just suppressing it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so after that, we get the title screen, Death Wish. Here we go. Yay. Hey, uh, we see a happy home life for the Kerseys. Uh, they're because all... you have to have something be lost in order to drive the character forward. Exactly. When so you the... refrigerate the dude's wife, he's got to have a wife that he loves and you yes. know, has a great relationship with. Exactly. So we see Paul with his wife, uh, daughter, living upscale neighborhood. Uh, his, very upscale. That very, house was amazing. As they wait they, to hear, his, his daughter gets into NYU. So everything's looking up for the Kersey family. You well, know? She gets a letter. She goes upstairs, yeah. screams her ass off, and then comes downstairs yeah. and tries to pretend like it's <laughs> no big cool. deal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you saw it in both their eyes where they're like, okay, great, she got in. They're yeah. super excited for her, but everybody's trying to play it nonchalant and cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the whole family's like really, weird the way that they react ah, to they're having fun they're a fun family and everything's looking up what, what I'm this sorry I wasn't raised in a house that was happy so I don't know what that's like <laughs> You want to you want to go out back later, play I'm some ball? Fucking fine, just okay. do the notes. You want to get another sleeve of tattoos? <laughs> I'm running out on body parts to tattoo. <laughs> gonna have to start getting them on my eyelids. Oh god, that's gonna be great. <laughs> Close it. Fuck you. <laughs> that is what I would do. Yeah, it is. Uh, anyway, so what this whole scene gets across is pretty much the the Kersies are a happy family and life is going great for them. So. You still see it too, where you can you can see this like melancholy You're thing that Bruce Willis is portraying. Yes. Even here when he's happy, yeah. you, if you pay attention enough, like he's super subtle with it, but he is actually doing it. Yes. I, I want to give him a little bit of, you, and of, also, of props I think, there. I think he even turns a little sadness in there because while he's happy his daughter's getting into NYU, she's moving now a half a country away from him. Right. You know, so that hurts a little bit. He He's trying, man. I'm going to say it. I'm going to give Bruce Willis some props. At least he's, I don't think he's phoning it in. He's trying in this movie. There are certain parts of the film where it's clear that he's, you know, Maybe he's having he good done. days and bad yeah. days. Yeah. We'll get into it, though. We'll let's, get into let's, it. Let's all right. Moving. All right. Let's get it. Here we see a little bit of that where you kind of get an idea this isn't the same, this next scene coming up, the same Paul Kersey that Bronson played. And, and I actually like this scene. This was the, um, the, they're at their daughter's soccer game and they're just talking, having a good time. And, and this is where Bruce Willis is kind of, you know, worried about her going to NYU, kind of a little sad. Yeah. And you hear a guy who's, you know, a really bad soccer dad. He's fucking swearing and like fucking and that's a bad call, Raph. All this fucking shit at a kid's fucking soccer game. Paul asks the man to settle down as he's getting way too aggressive and he at actually a girl's does a, soccer game. Yeah, and he's also really kind of
kind of doing it very politely where he's like, yeah. hey, pal, you want to, there's kids here. Do yeah, you want to yeah, tone it down, down a little bit? And then the guy starts to confront Paul and like, who the fuck are you? Like, what the fuck are you going to do? And he kind of even pushes Paul a little bit. And then you see it. Bruce Willis does this face change. Well, right he before he thinking, does, right before he does, the guy says, why don't you shut the fuck up? And yeah. then he goes, so that's a great yeah. idea. Why don't you do just that? Yeah, just like, shut the, and then he doesn't swear and he goes, oh. uh, and here's where I thought like, oh, they're going to show like the Paul Kersey character backing down and kind of like, you know, backing up a little bit. But he he does. He goes right back into his face. And, and But being like a good guy, bleeping himself out from saying fuck up and then staring at him. And you could tell this is a moment where Paul Kersey in the movie, he's like, is, am I going to flip the switch and like do go back to my old days and beat the shit out of this It's a guy. Billy Jack moment where he's like, just fucking hit me. Just do just it. Just fucking do it. I want you to do it. Like you can see it in his yeah, face. I will fucking break you in half, bitch. Yeah. He's just like, I'll fucking eat your babies. Because also, who the fuck is this guy to get so angry at somebody? He's fucking real thin, man. I could kick this guy's ass. I don't know, man. Fuck you. I could kick that guy's ass. Yeah, but Elizabeth Shue's character steps in. Now, Elizabeth Shue's character. I love how she fucking laughs at his face. Yeah, like, laughs at him. <laughs> like, fuck, dude. Poor guy. He's probably been laughed at by a lot of women. <laughs> Which is why he's so aggressive and angry at a girl's soccer game. Probably. <laughs> they back down. The guy um, ends up saying, well, you know, yeah, you need your fucking woman and your, you know, your fucking bitch and all that. And yeah, but he still backs away because the girl could probably kick his ass, yeah, too. Yeah, well, Elizabeth Shue would, would, would kick a motherfucker. She's got that karate kid skill. She knows yeah. what's up. Oh, she knows what she's doing. She hung out with Daniel's son. She yeah. knows what to do. Fuck it, she met Mr. Miyagi. She already knows how to do the crank kick. She went through some adventures in babysitting and fucking hung out with Thor as she a mechanic. Hung, she hung off a building, motherfucker. She knows what she's doing, all right? <laughs> yeah, if she can take on gangsters, that guy is nothing. Plus, she already befriended, befriended an inner city kid who stole cars. I'm surprised that she wasn't protected in this movie. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> um, anyway, the guy calls Paul a pussy and, you know, well, eventually yeah. goes off and Paul kind of... It, it, and I, under his breath, Paul's like, you're what you eat, pal. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And at that point, Mrs. Kersey seems like she's going to like want to start shit and Paul has to drag her away. Yeah, you do kind of see where fight. he kind of puts his arm around her. He's like, come on, honey, come on. Because I think she was good about ready to beat the shit out of him. I believe she probably would have. Yeah, I think so, too. So anyway, that gets done and we see that Paul Kersey is just a non-violent man, but there is something simmering behind those eyes where if that guy, I think, took a swing, I think Paul would have, like, beaten the shit out of him. It's a special type of non-violent. It's a person who knows that they cannot control themselves yeah. once, they get, once they get started, uh -huh. and their anger will overtake them, so they actively are passive. And, and not that, it's not like he knows I'm a super soldier fighter thing, but he's like, I know how to scrap, and maybe this guy will get a few shots in, but I at least know how to, you know, fight back. Well, no, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's so much that he knows that he knows or he'll how to just fight. go blank with rage yeah i know yeah. that i i think it's one of those things where he's like uh there's a part of me that loves to do this and it's going to enjoy hurting this man and i don't yeah. and i won't be able to stop and we find out more about this because we come to a lunch with paul his wife his daughter and his brother frank and that is our next clip okay so then the guy gets right in dad's face okay what? and he, he starts shoving him and it literally stops so, right 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 i had yeah. it in the middle of it i was gonna punch the guy oh right? my god why didn't you whoop this guy yeah. The oh, no, in his like in the no, old no, days, no. you should have just. Thank God your mom came over. <laughs> Wait, no. Dad, the old days. Uncle Frank. Yeah, yeah your dad was a scrapper. Yeah, I was a scrapper. Really? Oh, you yeah. told me He's that. About to... Would have back in the day. Wait, Wait hold on. Tell her, tell her. I used to fight my dad. Oh. Fighting all the time. Oh. Yeah, he was screaming and crying in the house. And guess who was crying? Me. I lost every fight. Damn. I still love you, Dad. Yeah, you, you, should, you should take Krav Maga. You study that. This way, when you go to college and these guys, when they get a little too aggressive with you, you know what to do. I'm not, yeah, yeah. don't look at me like I don't no, know what to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I was just saying, like, maybe I already know it. Oh, 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 oh. Jordan. All right, all right. All right. All right. Seriously, she trains Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, this one. Watch out. Really? I'm training, and I actually found a boxing gym in Tribeca that all the supermodels go to, so I'm going to start going there. Speaking <laughs> of college, how about your PhD? You're almost... Oh, that's uh, very nice of you to remember. Yes, 15 years in the making. I am soon to be a doctor. Cheers to mom, right? How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Two doctors. Two doctors. Two doctors. Can you believe it? Are you going to call Cheers, me doctor? Mama. Yes, I am. You are? Dr. Dr. Baby. Dr. Kirk. Baby. Thank you. <laughs> How about two curses that aren't crazy. doctors? So, How about so, cheers to us? Non-doctors. <laughs> How much? Two grand. What, two grand? What? Hey, man, you know, I've been convicted of a crime. Right? You know, I mean, it's not like I'm a criminal, but... It's cashmere. <laughs> it's okay. All right, thanks, man. Paulie, thank you. No worries.
damn, that deep dish pizza in that scene looked amazing. Did it not? Oh, my God. Oh, fuck. That <laughs> looks so good. <laughs> Let's go to Chicago and get deep dish fucking pizza. I got a question for you here. Um, the discussion with Paul's brother and Paul, yeah. where he's borrowing money and he says that he's a former criminal. Yeah. Do you feel like they were trying to red herring the brother here the whole way through the movie? No. I, I didn't feel like they were trying to red herring him. I think they were trying to show what type of family Paul comes from. Yeah. I think they were trying to show that look what Paul fought through because his brother wasn't able to fight through it, you know, and his brother kind of fell behind, but his brother is a good person. Like you can tell he must be a good uncle because it you know, took his more niece, for him to overcome the adversity. Yeah. His yeah. niece loves him. You know, it shows like there's a family unit and yeah. while, you know, a uh, Frank Kersey isn't perfect by any means, he's not a bad person. Yeah. And then it also serves to show that if Paul was probably scrapping with his dad, Frank was probably having to scrap with is his Paul, dad too. Is Paul the older brother? Paul is, I don't know. They're both so well There's, advanced in age. Yeah, but that you can't tell. I think so, but I don't quote me on that. Because the way that Paul talks about it, it makes it seem like in this scene that Paul was always fighting the dad so that his younger brother wouldn't get the abuse. Yeah. And that Paul would take the lumps. Yeah. And then once he discovered the train thing, he would go and hide and then maybe yeah, the we'll, little brother we'll get to would, that later yeah, too. Maybe the little brother got the lumps. Yeah. You know, from the dad as well. Yeah. Maybe so, that's how it works. But you kind of see like the way that Frank reacts with his brother, you he makes you feel like he's the little brother who looks up to Paul. He does. And he, in effect, he does. You know, yeah. you can tell he looks up to Paul. Paul, and you can tell it's not, well, Frank made mistakes. He is not a bad person. And you see that even more later on in the movie. He where went he, for, he probably went for easy money, did something stupid. And yeah. he's like, he said, I'm or not a criminal. Or drugs like, or just, something. Yeah. Right. He said like, I'm not a criminal, but I've been convicted of a crime. So it's hard for him to find a job. And that's yeah. why he needs the money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And see, I got the feeling like whenever they did that, I went, oh, movie, don't make it his own family. Oh. Like, the first time yeah, I watched like, it. You, you know, okay, I will say this. There was part of me that was like, maybe something Frank does causes people to go after his family. Right. And yeah, that would make me feel bad. Okay, now I get what you mean by yeah. the red herring thing. Yeah. Yes, I did think that. I yeah. thought, oh shit, something Frank's involved in. Right. And he owes the wrong people money. Or, and did yeah. he, did he basically offer up robbing his brother when his brother's out and that's where oh, it all see, comes I didn't from go as there. well? I didn't go there. That's what I was thinking yeah, the entire time. That could be time. too. Yeah. yeah, I could see that. I went with just he owed the wrong people money and like let's say Paul gives him the two grand but it's but not he like, enough or not, well it's enough but he blows it at the track when maybe it's a gambling problem then he can't pay anybody back and then yeah then you know the guy finds out well hey your brother's rich you know I'll just take it from that or, it, or it's a message it feels like at some point this was in the script that that's the way they were going to do it yeah and, and then, then they abandoned it yeah because there's a lot of stuff like that in the movie but let, let's is. continue yeah alright well anyway they're getting uh, their cars from the valet and we see a guy with uh, uh, Paul notices this guy he has MJ tattooed on his arm because you're a big Jordan fan. You know, we're in Chicago. Or he's a Michael Jackson fan. So, yeah, it could be. Uh, but uh, Paul is or he loves, he the, loves the Mary Jane. So, yeah, that too. But he said, no, it's his initials. Uh, he says his name's Miguel Javier. As they're waiting to get a grouse, Miguel overhears them all talking about how they're going out for uh, Paul's birthday that night. Yeah. Uh, out to a big dinner. Well, Miguel gets into the car after hearing that, looks up the GPS system in the Kersey's car and takes a picture of their address. So obviously he now hears a fan family who that you can tell are well off are going to be out for the night should be an easy score probably is what he's thinking yeah but, yeah <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah 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 it should be an easy score it should be yeah yeah <laughs> i don't know why ricky's encouraging people to go rob other people you know ricky has his own agenda and <laughs> we should respect it fair enough all right yeah <laughs> so anyway uh it is now paul's time for paul's birthday dinner they're all getting ready and paul gets a call from the hospital uh he has to, um, the doctor who's going to cover for him tonight has like a hundred and some degree fever. And so Paul has to go into work. He's and, got a fever and the only prescription is more cowbell. Yeah. And, uh, but you have to be at home for getting that cowbell. You got to let the cowbell settle in for about 24 hours before the fever will go down. <laughs> so, um, then we get like a weird scene where Paul's walking down the hallway and another doctor comes up and just says, sorry. I don't know. The scene seemed really unnecessary. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff like we were talking about there's earlier. A lot of where cut scenes where it seems just, I don't know why that's in there. Yeah. I don't know how that made the final cut because literally it's the doctor going, hey, sorry, Paul, happy birthday. And he washed past him. And Paul goes, yeah, thanks. And that was it. And it's like, do we really need that movie? Y yeah. I You're an hour and 40 minutes and we could have trimmed a good 10 seconds we right there. Been, we could have been an hour and 30. This movie is an e a movie 
easily could have been an hour. Hour 20. Uh, yeah, even that. This movie could have easily been 10 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> uh, there's some legitimately no, good saying, stuff yeah, in no, there. I'm, yeah. I, was just I don't disagree about that scene. That's one that could have been yeah, easily I, dropped. I just, I, I just put in my notes. I'm like, that was weird. Why are we? It, it, we start, I'm like, well, maybe he's something's going to happen here. And then it cuts right away again. I'm like, why the fuck did that? You could have even kept that scene where he's getting ready to go do a surgery and that doctor says that to him when he does the one surgery when they find out what happens later on in the movie. Yeah. Why something. even put it in there? That makes I, no sense to be there. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, um, the mom and daughter get home from grocery shopping. They're going to make a cake. Yeah, that uh, was something that they discussed that since they can't yeah. get his favorite cake at the right. restaurant. But she's like, why don't we just like go pick it up and then bring it home and then we don't have to bake. The, Jordan the daughter is making a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> like that and, they can just pick it up from the restaurant yeah, that she doesn't have to actually bake the cake. She goes, well, but this could be made by us. <laughs> the mom was like, this could be made by us. It's not going to be the same. It'll be like the same, only not as good and stuck because yeah. we made it ourselves. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like when I tried to make my wife breakfast, you know, for like Mother's Day. It, you know, I could do it, but it'll just go horribly and no one will eat. <laughs> <laughs> she's basically trying to pass the time till Paul comes home. Yeah. That's why she's making the cake. Yeah. And she wants some mother-daughter bonding time. Yeah. Lucy asks uh, Jordan to go upstairs to grab her iPad. She does. And as she's up there. Yeah, because the recipe's on there already yeah, or something. Yeah, but Lucy also breaks out a, uh, a recipe book. And as she's loose, she knows like a page get flipped on its own. She looks up and she sees that a small pane of one of the windows has been broken. And like there's wind coming in. Mm-hmm. And that's when she's she's getting a little curious about this. Well, no, she's not curious. She gets well, uncomfortable little, yeah, and uncomfortable. gets real stressed And fast. then she's walking and then she sees footprints, like muddy footprints. Yep. And that's when then she starts yelling at Jordan to come downstairs right now. Yo, come downstairs. I want you to come downstairs. And Jordan's on the phone, like talking to one of her friends. Being and, a typical teen, talking shit yeah. about her mom spazzing yeah, out. Yeah, well, you know, gra- like telling her I'm grabbing a charger. Well, we see we have three assailants in the house. And one grabs Jordan, comes downstairs, and uh, they kind of show that they have Jordan by gunpoint. So Elizabeth... He grabs Jordan. She ends up yeah. dropping her phone and screaming, even though she was yeah. on the phone with her friend. Yeah. And I have a feeling that the friend that she was on the phone with shows up later on in the film. Yes, I believe so. I think it was that friend who overheard it as it was happening. Yeah. And uh, she, um, they threatened Jordan with shooting her if, and the lead guy says, here's what's going to happen, lady. You're going to save me 20 minutes tonight by going upstairs and opening it up safe. And, you know, Elizabeth Shue totally wants her daughter to be safe, so she is going through everything they have in the safe. She says, you know, we have watches. We have a couple watches in there. We have $2,000 in cash, and I think some other things. Uh, then we get a pretty terse couple scenes here. Uh, it begins with Elizabeth Shue not quite being able to remember the She's flustered as fucking panicking. She's worried about what's happening to her daughter downstairs while she's trying to open the safe. Um, Right before they all go upstairs, I'm sorry, I almost missed this, the lead guy says, no funny business, and then takes the mom upstairs. And he's looking at one specific guy, like, don't fuck around on this job. Anyway, two of them are left to watch Jordan, and one of the guys uh, brings out a knife and starts, like, caressing Jordan's hair. It's like a knife gun. Yeah, and the other guy raises up his gun, almost pointing it at his accomplice and says, stop it. Remember what he said. Said, no funny business. And then he goes, that's fine. And he goes, I'm going to go. And then he asks uh, the, the other guy, the non-creepy guy, uh, as non-creepy as a assailant can be, asks Jordan where rope is. And she's like, maybe the garage. And he goes, all right. And he goes to look. And why would you leave the guy you know has a has a problem with not making it funny business? Why would you send him to oh, it's look also for the rope? It's also important to note that the knife that has like a gun handle to yeah. it got set down on the counter right near Jordan. Yes. And she makes note of it when the guy yes, puts it down. Yes, he sets it down. Yeah. But why wouldn't you send the creepy fuck? The guy who you know mm-hmm. is the guy who's the, kind of the problem with this. I would be like, all right, go find the rope. And he was like, no, I want to stay here. I go, yeah, I know you do. That's why you're going to go find the fucking rope. <laughs> yeah. Well, you want to know why that is? Why? Because they had to put something yeah. fucking rapey in the yeah, movie yeah, because yeah, it's exactly. a Death Wish movie. So anyway, as he's looking, the guy's like, wow, you're really strong as he's trying to force Jordan's legs apart. And then we cut to a scene at back where Elizabeth Shrew's still trying to get everything open and she finally does. And the lead guy's like, don't worry, I know you can do it. You'll, you'll do it. You, I know you can do it. Like, But ominously saying, I know you can do it. But he's looking under the mattress. He's yeah. digging around other places looking for anywhere that somebody might have been hiding some money. Yeah. Um, Really not paying attention to her because if a gun was in that safe, he oh would have been done. Yeah, he's dead to right. Yeah. But I think he's also counting on, if you hear a gunshot up there, they'll the, kill the daughter they'll down kill there. The daughter down yeah, there. I think he's banking on that, that yeah. he doesn't have to worry too much about the mom trying to do anything. Um, He finally kind of gets her legs apart and he's they getting, cut down to show yeah, that yeah cut back down he finally is able to get Jordan's legs apart he's getting in between her legs and like you know telling her you know hey don't worry about it and I, he's not getting like super super crazy about it he's just pushing her legs yeah. apart so he can stand
hand in between them, and then he's running. The, that's when he starts running his hand yeah, up and so, yeah. asks her if she plays sports or yeah, something you know, like that. Oh, you, well, I think he sees um, the trophy. Trophy. He sees the trophies, and he goes, "I like that. You know, I like that you play sports." And it's yeah. just like, "Oh fuck!" Well, the guy finally comes back with some cable and kind of flips out on the guy, and he goes, "And he goes, dude, what's your hurry?" Because he's tying her up. He goes, "Dude, let's just get out of here." And, well, and then let, he says, "Give me two done. minutes, please." He goes, he goes, "Well, give me ten minutes, man. Fuck, just give me two minutes." And I'm like, "You fucking." And he goes, "I need this, you know." And it's like, "No, man." And he looks at him. He goes, "It's not that kind of party." And then that's when they actually draw guns on one another. Yeah. Because he's like, "Yo, you're fucking this up," and I'm gonna. Well, the one know. guy, the one guy calls him like a pussy or some yeah. shit like that yeah. because he wouldn't let him do it. And then he pulls a gun on him. And because of this little confusion, that's when Jordan uses that to her advantage. Yes, because of the confusion, Jordan picks up the knife uh-huh. and slices the guy's face because he's a rapist. Fuck. Yes. Now, right at the same time, we go back up. Uh, Elizabeth uh, gets the uh, Lucy gets the safe open. <laughs> <laughs> and they get all the stuff into the bag and then they head downstairs. Right as they come downstairs, that's when the face slashing scene happens. Jordan gets pushed to the ground and the guy takes off his mask and screaming about screaming. how she cut my fucking face. And, now, and then the lead guy's like, you fucking idiot. Now she can see your fucking face. Yeah. And then that's when Elizabeth Shue realizes, fuck, this is going to be bad. Yeah. Because now they, there's no way they're letting us out of here. So yeah. she uh, elbows the one guy kind of in the face, doesn't she? Yeah. Some, the, or, the main, or neck she, or something. She, like. she elbows the the lead guy in the neck or in the face and then takes a, the boiling pot of hot water and throws it in raping McMurray person's face. Yeah, which and it's really good of like digital effect where you see the burns start to happen on yeah. his face from yeah, the and water he's hitting. Screaming. The guy, that guy did an awesome scream. Yeah. Like, and the entire time that this is happening, Elizabeth Shue, right after she throws the water, screams, run, run. Jordan, yeah, run. She starts running, you run, Jordan, run. And as Jordan starts getting up, the lead guy who has been elbowed, he recovers and he goes, fuck this. And then we see the outside of the house and we hear two shots. So we don't know exactly how Jordan got shot or what happened to yeah, Jordan. we just see the guy raise up a gun. Yeah, and we don't know exactly what happened with Elizabeth Shue's character. We just know that violence occurred. Violence, yes, yeah. occurred. And for an Eli Roth film, this is surprisingly and I, shockingly non-rapey no, and, yeah, and I, non-gross. <laughs> we got into the scene and I'm like, I was preparing because I know it's an Eli Roth movie. Yeah. I was preparing for the worst of this scene. I was really like, oh, fuck. Yeah. What's, you know, what's going to happen? And then when that all, that's all that happened, I went, wow, Eli Roth must have really wanted this to be a commercial success because he uh, he toned it down. <laughs> well, he still worked his Eli Rothisms in later on. Up to this point so far, the film has actually been relatively solid. Yes. There's a few things where we're like, okay, well, that scene's not needed, but that's minor quibbles. Minor. Up to this, to this point, 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 it's been a very solid film. Yeah, and so far, it's towed the line enough for this yeah. type of revenge film, and it's been surprisingly and it's well-made and just showing you just enough to get the story across. And well shot, too. Yeah. And it's just different enough from the original death Death wish is be interesting. So, <laughs> Plus, no Jeff Goldblum forcing mouth rape on someone. Yeah, well, that's that's always nice too. So you know, um, so we're back at uh, the hospital. And Dr. Kersey is um, working on a patient when he hears a uh, it's like finishing up, and then he hears uh, an alert alarm come on. Two females, both ages, which match up his wife and daughter's ages, which doesn't shot. freak him out yet. But he gets the ages, and then they were shot, and that's when he's like, huh? He goes, "We close up for me," and he leaves to check some things out. And that's when he comes in, he's getting ready to get into the OR and stopped by security and another doctor saying, you was, just was that, was that Mike Epps? Mike Epps is the other doctor. Yeah. It was the other yes, doctor? The okay. other doctor and his friend doctor is Mike Epps. Yeah. He has a little parts uh, in this film. Oddly enough, it, it's going to sound weird for me to say this, but I enjoy Mike Epps when he pops up. I do too. I like Mike Epps. <laughs> I, like, he, uh, I liked him in the Resident Evil series. He was amazing in that. I loved him. Yeah. He was one yeah. of the one of the highlights of that really bad series. Oh yeah. Yeah. Really bad. But goddamn. <laughs> Was he entertaining in it? Yeah. Um, My shit is custom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking love that. <laughs> or when he's out there, like the uh, the stars guys, the, the guys taking pot shot because he thinks he's a zombie. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> out in the middle, middle of a zombie apocalypse he's almost getting taken out by cops yeah. well that is pretty fitting for a black man to have happen to him I guess especially in a lot of zombie movies man uh, not even just all zombie no, no, movies they, but well, in real life yeah well that's true too regardless of zombies or not um so Paul kind of pushes his way past he comes up to one room and the nurses are there cleaning up and 
it's empty. And they say, your daughter's been taken up to OR. He goes, what about my wife? And then he walks down and there's another doctor who gives him the same speech he gave the cop. Yeah. Sorry, we did everything we could. Which is kind of how doctors are, but they yeah. didn't go for the cliche movie thing where it's a disaffected doctor. Yeah, they, they all have emotion in their voices. Like, Paul had emotion in his voice talking to the cop. This doctor obviously has emotion in his voice, probably knew his wife, you know, probably met her if they all mm. work at the same hospital. I'm sure that. there was some kind of hospital, like, fundraising mixer thing that they yeah, all got. Yeah, they all met, they know, yeah. and Paul seems like a very well-liked guy at his job. Plus, so. his wife is Elizabeth Shue, who doesn't know Elizabeth Shue. Exactly. They're like, hey, you're the babysitter, right? <laughs> Weren't you the girl that broke Daniel LaRusso's heart? You bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's why the three assailants chose that house. Uh, MJ noticed that it was Elizabeth Shue, he's like, she broke Danielson's heart. <laughs> Fucking, we're gonna get vengeance tonight. No, no, Daniel said, knowing him, he's probably like, man, she broke Johnny from Cobra Kai's <laughs> heart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Johnny was just trying to live his life. <laughs> it's uh, her fault that that series got made. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, we see he's sad. Um, you know, he's broken down over Lucy's body. Another scene I want to point out too, where it's pretty on par and Bruce Willis is acting is great. He doesn't usually do grief that well to no, me. No, I thought he did grief really well. Here. And his, his crying that he does, uh -huh. he usually does it for a comedic effect in some movies. Yeah. But in this one, when he's like openly weeping and really sad yeah. about his wife, like when I watched this in the theater with my wife, I reached out and grabbed her hand. Like it really he, affected he, me he, that he, much. Yeah. He did it really well. Yeah. I, I'm telling you right now on the good days that uh, Willis showed up to set for this movie. He fucking acted his ass off. Yeah, he nailed it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, and this is where I kind of, I love Frank, uh, where you see Frank is a good person and a good brother, and it, where he really cared for, especially for his niece and his sister-in-law. Because we see Frank and Paul, and they're talking to Detective Rains and Jackson, and that is our next clip. Our passports, Jordan's birth certificate, $2,000 in cash, my uh, Stanford class ring, two Panerai watches on the desk. Can you describe the watches? One was all black. That one was, was a birthday present. Silver and black. Were there any firearms in the house? No. A lot of these guys, they they break in looking for guns because they're easy to sell. I had a couple of assholes break into my house looking for mine. So that's what you think this was? It was a robbery gone bad? Well, there have been a string of break-ins along the North Shore, so we're looking at the possibility. You said string. How many in this string? Uh, six in the last nine months. Six? Six robberies? Did you know about this? No, I didn't know about it. Well, you don't think it's important enough to tell the residents? We post every crime on the neighborhood watch. If it's big enough, the media picks it up and reports about it. If not, these are just burglaries. So. Just burglaries. Frank, that's not what he meant. No, I'm just, I'm just wondering if it's important enough now to go on their radar. You're not helping. Hey, guys, it's been a long night. I think we got enough to yeah. start with. Yeah, yeah. It's, my, uh, it's my card. Thanks. It's got my cell phone number on there. If you got anything else. Thank you, Detective Prince. You know, I, I, I get that you're upset. We're upset, too. But we're going to get these guys. Again, I'm uh, deeply sorry for your loss. Thanks for your time. Dr. Kersey, your daughter's out of surgery. When I had that inclining or that feeling that maybe his brother was going to be involved in the yeah. robbery, the way that he was talking to the cops and the way that he was acting, mm -hmm. it felt like he was pumping them for information to know if they oh. had any inclination because he was worried about himself getting busted. Yeah. And that's why he was being overly dramatic and rage-filled about the situation. And I took it as, when I watched it, because he had said, you know, technically I'm a felon, you know, or I was convicted of a crime, you know, when he was talking to Paul earlier, yeah, uh, asking for money, I get the idea that he, it's kind of like you, doesn't much care for cop thinks are probably more useless than useful and <laughs> is a little pissed off that maybe he got busted for something that's so nonviolent. Oh yeah, that's and, a good way to interpret it. Yeah, yeah, he got busted for something that's so nonviolent that's ruined his life. And that while well, three guys who murdered two members of his family yeah. are all scot free and they have no lead. Oh yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, that's yeah. a nice perspective. Yeah. Because I can see where having negative interaction with the police like that would make you hate them. I mean you get busted Well I didn't I didn't get arrested for yeah. anything, but I've just never had a good experience well, with a cop. What if you get busted for like so like a white collar crime and you get just railroaded in in our court systems and then you know some guy fucking molests a kid and it's like well you have probation because you wouldn't do well in prison I mean this whole court system yeah. Is fucked yeah well I think the entire system is what is angering him in this situation yes. but to me I'm always looking for the nefarious turn where oh, someone's yeah. gonna do like I I see the worst in people you I do. really do and that's what I saw in his character I'm like oh fuck your own family dude yeah like right. and I was really worried about that because I'm like, not Vincent D'Onofrio. I want him to be a good guy. Yeah, no, he, he, he is. He is. So don't let anybody worry. Yeah. Court just 
you know, is a pessimist. <laughs> I really am. Yeah. All right. Well, Jordan, we find out this surgery was successful. However, she is in a coma. Uh, yeah. So did she get shot in the head? Is that what's happening here? Because they don't really say, but that's what they're kind of implying. What, was she that she was shot? That she was shot in the head and that's why she's in a coma. Uh, no, I believe. I don't know. Maybe she was shot. They never say where she was shot, but perhaps she, she looks, got shot and got hit head first. I, I'm and, just saying in, in, in the coma scene, when we see her mm-hmm. right after the surgery, she, she doesn't have anything in her head. No bandages or nothing. Yeah. So I don't, I think she was shot someplace vital though. Maybe like in the lungs or some shit like that, that shut her down. Like not the heart, but enough to where she yeah. couldn't go on and they, yeah. it wasn't a medically induced coma. It was a physically induced coma. It was a coma. physical yeah. coma, but she's out. You know what uh, she was shot with? What? A refrigerator bullet that put her into the refrigerator to drive Paul Kersey forward. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> she, Paul at Lacey's bedside saying how he has to take her mom to her grandfather uh, for a funeral. We are at Lucy's funeral which it must be at her father lives on a farm and has land and she is buried next to her mother. Um, we get a, as they're driving, you know, he's asking, you always, Paul, you always have a place here. You know, the dad's being very supportive of Paul. You know, you, know, you always have a place here. Uh, you know, you, 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 almost like saying, you know, when your time comes, I hope you're buried out here too with all of us, you know? Yeah. Like he, he'll bury, be buried up there and the dad will and then maybe Paul will. Very and, typical salt of the earth. Yeah. Um, um, you know, rural American kind of guy. As uh, they're talking, almost a trope. Yeah, this guy because he's so kind-hearted. Uh, and then as we're driving, he's asking about the investigation. Paul's kind of explaining. He slams on the brakes and gets out. And you're like, this is kind of weird. Like you stare, and then he's staring out and almost seems nothing. He catches Paul so unaware. Paul almost yeah. eats the fucking dash. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, he, and he, at first I'm thinking, oh shit, he's gonna like flip out. Like you fucking idiot. You know, you're fucking costing me my daughter's life. And because all this we're shit. expecting him to act yeah. like fucking Bronson would yeah. in this. Yeah. Scene because that's the kind of guy that you're expecting him to be. And then he gets in, he goes, damn poachers. And he goes, we're going to get them. Get ready. And they, Paul's like, what? And he cuts through the lawn. And you do. You see uh, a bunch of guys surrounding uh, one of his animals. And, uh, so I don't even think it's one of his it's animals. It's just they're it's hunting like in his field yeah, and it's posted land. Poaching, yeah. yeah. So he gets out and he starts shooting at them. And they they run. And he doesn't hit them, but he scares them enough that they get away. It's clear that he's purposely shooting over their head, yeah. but he's letting them know that I will fuck you up if you don't leave. Paul comes out and we get a pretty good anti-cop speech from the dad saying cops are only there after things happen. There, You have to be able to prevent it. Yeah, why wasn't before. that a clip? What? Why wasn't that a clip? It almost was. It almost was. You know why it wasn't a clip? Because well, you're not me and you knew that yeah, I would be yeah, like, yeah. fuck yeah! <laughs> yeah! You would like, we'd be here for three more hours as you gushed over that clip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You realize that this is the segment where he goes off to the cabin or Arizona yes, or whatever where he prepares his, for what he's going to do. This is his come to Jesus moment where he's like, well, fucking A, he's uh, right. No, this isn't come to Jesus. This, oh, yeah. is, this sign, is sign the dark book and yeah. become one yeah, of yeah. the executioners. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> Jesus wants nothing to do with what Paul Kersey's about to be about. Exactly. <laughs> um, anyway, we come back into the city. Uh, cops are getting nowhere with Jordan's, uh, with the case. Uh, we see you, uh, as you talked before, we're back at Jordan's bedside and her friend is uh, reading to her. Um, you know, reading her like an economics book. It's her summer reading list that yeah. you have. What fucking colleges give you a summer reading list? The best, the good ones do. Apparently. Yeah, the, the, like the ones where you... Like, you must it, be prepared ahead of time so yeah, read this NY, in the summer. Because this is her friend who she's going to NYU with. Or, and, or would have before yeah. she took a bullet. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, you know... As far as we know now, And anyway. Paul was very happy, though, to see his daughter's friend there. And, you know, a good support system. And really the daughter's friend where she's like, you know, maybe the whole thing about her reading to her, yeah. you know, she's like, well, maybe this way she won't fall behind. Yes, that's what she said. Like, yeah. it's not going to do her any good to read her a book that she doesn't know, but maybe it would be a way that it'll sink in or something Osmosis like that. Osmosis or something like that. Yeah, and it's just a friend who's trying to be supportive. Yeah, or in, in sad. I mean, it seems like that was her best friend. They had a lot of plans for a future to have fun together at college stuff, so. You know the way that the daughter reacts whenever the uncle brings up wrestling with boys that uh, you know, or being able to defend yeah, yourself oh, yeah, against yeah. boys who get a little aggressive? Yeah. You get the feeling that maybe Paul Kersey's daughter doesn't like guys, and maybe this isn't just a friend. Maybe it's her uh, girlfriend. May- I didn't get that feeling, but uh, once you say it, you can see it. I mean, I wouldn't doubt it, but... See, that's me thinking Eli Roth would do something like that just to right. try and throw it in and make it like somewhat salacious or whatever. Yeah. But if that's the case, if it was there in the script and that was the idea, they handle it rather non-salaciously. Yeah, and, rather delicately, yeah. you know. And who cares what she's into? Yeah. And, and that's not what it's about. It's Nobody's a, business. Yeah, once she's in the refrigerator, it's 
all about Paul getting revenge yeah, about her being put time. in the fridge. Yeah, that's it. Doesn't matter who she wants no to. No one bag. puts baby in the fridge. <laughs> no one puts Jordan in the fridge. Yeah, right. Elizabeth Shue, however, but can he be calls put in the everybody fridge. baby. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's what Bruce Willis does. So no one puts baby in the fridge. <laughs> uh, we see Paul. He's at a psychiatrist's office, and that is our next clip. I can't sleep in our bed, so I sleep on the couch, watch TV until I pass out. And even then, I. I'm just not getting any sleep. That's to be expected. I can prescribe sleeping pills if it gets worse. I feel like I'm in purgatory. I can't go back to work. I can't be around my house. When I was a kid, I used to ride the trains to avoid my father. And I would even do my homework then just to stay away from him. So I've been doing that, just riding the trains, just to think. I wish I could say everything I see reminds me of Lucy, but everything I see reminds me of them, the men I've never seen, the men who came and took her from me. I thank God for George. I try to stay strong. Good clean cut, right? With as many as 90 shootings in a week, violent crime in Chicago is now at a 20 year high. While but it's hard to escape the feeling that I failed. Failed to protect my wife. Failed to protect my daughter. Failed at the most important things a man does. Here you go. Thanks, man. No, it's not a you. E K E R S E Y. Right. Kersey. Detective Reigns isn't it. Would you like to leave a message? Yes. This is a process. And it's going to take time. I know it's a process. I'm just starting to wonder about the result. That's all. All right, here is where I really feel like this is one of the days where Bruce Willis showed up and he's like, I don't want to do this psychiatrist couch horse shit because he's so flat and so dead and just so yeah. you can tell it's not him betraying it. Like, I don't ha- I don't want to feel anything. So therefore, I'm numbing myself emotionally. Mm-hmm. This is Bruce Willis not wanting to do these scenes. Yeah. <laughs> like the he's him riding like, the train, all this like sad mopey shit. He doesn't want to do it at like all. like the actress playing this. It's like, like, I don't know. Either that or he just woke just up on the wrong w- yeah, side of the fucking woke bed. Up or shitty and. Yeah, because he's really clearly not even trying. Bruce Willis is the kind of guy, like, uh, to lift back the veil, everyone, Court right now is suffering from a severe migraine, and he put his game face on, <laughs> is doing the show like he's, like, not in pain at all. Bruce Willis has no game face. Either Bruce Willis is feeling great, or Bruce Willis is in a shitty mood. And you know it either way. There's, you can't, like, there are people out there, like, I, Court is one, I can do it too, where I could be in a shitty-ass mood, or maybe even afraid I'm having a heart attack, but God damn it. <laughs> You put your game fucking face on and you do, you know, you, you go do your job and you fucking do it well. Bruce Willis is the kind of guy who just lets his emotions run all over him. If he wakes up in a pissed off mood, then he's like, I don't know if he's always done that or if it's just that his current success has afforded him the ability to be temperamental like that. But there are stories of him being difficult on sets like this for a while now. So I'm pretty sure that that might be the case. He's just a grumpy old man now. <laughs> well, so am I, but I'm powering through it. But we're not quite old, that old yet, but I <laughs> no, mean, we're not, getting there. We're not Bruce Willis old, but yeah, we're, we're not. We're not. Yeah, we're not Bruce Willis old yet, but we're getting there. All of our best years are behind us, and there's very few years ahead of us, Matt. Wait, those were our best years, <laughs> sadly. Oh God, <laughs> my life is so sad. I know. Now do the notes. Okay, <laughs> I have time to pull myself together. <laughs> Game face. All right. <laughs> I'm not gonna cry. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna cry. I didn't cry. I didn't cry. <laughs> Kersey goes to a police station, and the cops are nowhere with the case, and. And there's pretty much nothing that Paul can do. And Paul keeps asking, is there like, can I hire a private investigator? They'll just, they won't take criminal cases. Again, I'm surprised you didn't grab this as a clip because yeah, this is very important story I, stuff. I thought about it. And for some reason, I just instead wanted to write Because you were afraid out. I would start railing against yes, the cops? exactly. I well, will, not that. I will no, say I this. Just Dean, Dean Norris's character in yeah. this film, Reigns, is what a cop really should be for yeah. the most part. There's a certain point where he has a turn where I'm like, come on, Reigns. You know, looking back on it, I really should have grabbed that as a clip. And I really thought about it. And then I I just kind of went on with the notes because I was kind of in a mode of doing notes. It's though. much better than the fucking psychiatrist bit. I would have skipped over I know. that. I guess I went through the psychologist bit. I don't know why. I just like to go through Kersey's mindset. Yeah, No, because that's part of what this show is, is yeah. the psychology behind it. It's just that that particular well, anyway, clip was bad. As Kersey looks up, as he's talking to him, he sees all these post-it and he's like, what's that? And he goes, those are all the unsolved cases that we have. The blue ones are all unsolved, right? Yeah, the blue one. And he yeah. goes, now most of them, he goes, don't bother. Most of them are just gang on gang violence. That's all Almost all of the are gang on gang violent. Yeah. And he goes, and the third killing each other, I don't even care. It's, it's pretty much what he's kind of saying. Yeah. yeah, let's work for me. I don't really care. He goes, it's the ones like your family. Those are the ones that bother me. And 
he goes, he goes, but I need you to have faith in the system. And that's when Paul looks it back on the board. He goes, I wonder how much faith they had. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, thinking about all of them. So because of this stuff where he's working with Dean Norris, it feels to me more like Bruce Willis gave a shit this day that they were shooting yeah. this. Yes, scene. he did because yeah. he played a, a great. Well, and Dean Norris seems to be a very generous actor where he will give you everything while he is acting with yeah. you or in he's going to give you a lot to work with. Yeah. He really does seem like a very generous actor. Yes, he does. All right. That night, Paul is walking and he sees two guys kind of hassling a, a lady. And uh, if he, by trying to commit sexual assault, yeah, you mean the, hassling, then yeah, yes, no, he's hassling. Yes, there. Um, as he tries to intervene, he gets the ever loving shit beaten out of him. Yeah, they stomp his guts in. Yeah, they really give him a number. While he may have been a scrapper in his day, he still succumbed to a sucker punch like yes, anybody would. Like a bitch. Those yeah. guys sucker punched him like a bitch. So <laughs> there's no rules in street fighting. Eh, have some honor. <laughs> there's no honor in street fighting. It's not pugilistic rage. There could be it's honor. Hey, there could be honor in street fighting. If I'll, I'll admit you could run a, you can run anarchy if you admit there's honor in street fighting. <laughs> there is no honor. In well, street then fighting. you can't run anarchy. <laughs> No, Matt, there's it's it's the Captain Jack rules of of how you survive for street fighting. There's uh, only two rules, what a man can't do and what a man can do. Yeah, all right. I get you. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh Paul is at home laying on his couch cuz he can never sleep and he's watching a gun store commercial. And including oh, one little bit in the movie, I noted this I go, "Huh, look at that. A gun hiding drawer. I wonder if that's going to come back." Oh yeah, that was the most obvious <laughs> foreshadowing <laughs> you just ever. Sit there, you're like, "Oh, yeah, that's that's not going to come well, back or it nothing. looks like a really nice fucking coffee table where you're like oh yeah, yeah that's that's, that's going to be that's th- going to be important that's going to be a thing it's a thing thank yeah, you dave thanks dave thanks <laughs> yeah um and also we just want to point out too the the things that the lady's saying while she's doing this where she like fires a big fucking gun and is like and it's a very attractive woman yeah, it's so sexualized the way that she's firing it, the gun that makes things move and jiggle and it's stuff it's very much like any beer commercial with girls in bikinis with sports cars that drink this beer this could be your life you jet setting motherfucker right and then she'll turn to the camera and she'll say things like cops never show up in time you call them they're there seven minutes later after you and your entire family have been slaughtered therefore you must buy our guns and you can take care of yourself it's self-reliance you must kill with our guns and now here's me in a bikini firing said gun that will save your family because you'll be a real man when you buy this gun <laughs> cha-ching 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 cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. <laughs> the nra just got another billion yeah. <laughs> from <This> russia anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so after all this Paul goes into that very gun store. Uh, he starts like and the uh, lady in the commercial yeah, working is, the counter. Yeah, she's working the counter. She's selling them, like telling them all the things of what it takes to buy a gun, like the paperwork. And uh-huh. Paul's starting to notice all the cameras, and then he gets a little bit more freaked out about all the paperwork he has signed because yeah. everything's registered. You know, yeah, you can't be a good guy with a gun going out and murdering bad guys with guns when your gun is fully traceable. Yeah, and you you're on camera buying said gun. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so he says he um uh, he's gonna have to think about it and leaves the store as he's like well, fuck back to the drawing board and I, I use the term good guy with a gun loosely because nobody who's actively going out to murder somebody else it's, with a gun a is technically guy. a good guy at this point uh, I was wondering do you think Paul has foregone decided I'm going on a vengeance killing spree or is he still thinking about it like is he still hesitant I think that wanting to stop other people from being victimized is a drive that he has because what happened to his wife and his child and there were no repercussions so I think that he is toying with the idea What they should have ended up having him do is something similar to the scene where he first started with the sock full of quarters. Yeah. He should have had a knife or a scalpel, something something from the hospital where when the guys went to beat him down, like he he, he was able to get like like a jump on them or or not necessarily a jump on them. Like, let's say the same thing happens with the guy sucker punches him, they're kicking him in the ribs, but he has a knife on him or a scalpel on him that he took from the hospital and he hamstrings one of the guys. The guy, the guy falls over. The other guy goes to kill him and then he stabs that guy in the in the leg or whatever, you know, and I then, think that would might have been a more of a a nice little grill because at this point I'm like, is he considering it? Is it only the cameras and paperwork stopping him? Yeah, you know, well, or, I think, or is it also maybe he's like, God damn, is this like it's? Don't get me wrong, I think the cameras and the paperwork had something to do with it because it makes it traceable. Yeah, but is it also maybe like the realization, shit, am I really about ready to buy a gun and go like on a on a murder spree of my own? I think he was already by the time he goes to buy the gun. I think he was already had the foredrawn conclusion that he was going 
going to do this. I think the, the beatdown he got in the alley, I think, oh, was, yeah. the, was the yeah. was the over like you're, you're in, like a, like a roller coaster. He's at the very tippy top of the first big climb, and then that beatdown is the one that sends the ride. You know, yeah. Well, he knows that he doesn't have it in him anymore to be able to do the physical fighting violence as much, and he needs a weapon of some sort, which is why he goes to the gun shop. Yes, and I think he may not have actually been intending to go out and just specifically only be killing people. Yeah. But I think that I think he, he was, wanted to be able to stop someone from doing something and harming someone I, else. Yes, maybe even that. Like, yeah. uh, I'm done with, you know, being a bystander in life. I'm not going to let another person get it, victimized like my wife and child. And those could be this. I'm done being a victim. Because technically, even though Paul wasn't there, he's, he's a, a victim. Yeah. He's a victim of this crime as well. Yeah. And maybe he's tired of being the victim. He's a victim to his father. Yeah. He's kind of a victim to his brother, giving him money and bailing him out. Yeah. Uh, no, Maybe he's not, not really a victim to his brother. Yeah, but he was a victim to his brother. His brother's father. also a victim of the system, yeah. too. Like, so he's victim to his yeah. father, but then he, he lives the right life. I mean, and he, we're going to get into that because yeah, he has a great speech of yeah. that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that alone. But he's he's felt like a victim now twice in two major points in his life. Uh-huh. A father who you're supposed to be able to trust and someone you're supposed to be able to go to. And then he loses his entire family yeah. who, he, who he did have that trust and love relationship with. I don't think when he goes to the gun store, he is 75% over the, the like he's not like the over halfway ready to become vigilante killer yeah I think he's just looking for a way to be able to feel safer and defend himself after the beatdown. yes I think the demarcation point and the part that makes him go beyond and start doing what he ends up doing eventually for the rest of the film is coming up in the next scene after yes. this yeah alright so we're gonna get to that here now we're gonna get into some good stuff here we we have the build up now it's time to at yeah. least try to have some fun all of the characters are appropriately placed in the fridge yes. now it's time for the revenge all the pieces on the chest board are together it's action time we see in the next scene at in the hospital a, a guy who was shot is brought into paul's or room or er room and paul while working on him sees a glock falls out of his pants out of the bottom of his pants it must have been hidden paul sees it and quickly just kicks it underneath the cot as they work on him how does a glock fall in an or room and no <laughs> one hears it yeah i don't know i was like it's uh, like the tree in the forest yeah right <laughs> hey listen man if you're gonna ask questions now about this kind of shit we're going to end this review. <laughs> Just have by faith, all right? Yeah. It's kind of like the, oh, how does the Millennium Falcon go to hyperspace? I'm like, they're space wizards, you fucking idiot. Just see the Metachlorians. Yeah, Metachlorians. It's like, guys, just stop it, okay? <laughs> what I'm getting at, though, is what they should have done is he should have seen the gun starting to fall and ca- caught, caught, and it, or caught it and caught it up against the bed and yeah. then let it slide down his leg quietly. Something like that, Like, to yeah. make it more active instead of he's and the only we- one in the hospital room that hears it fall. And also, that would have been a little bit more suspenseful. Like, you know, yeah. it's like, the can he get the, the gun away? Yeah. Can he get it? I think that, you, that, dude, that would have been a great scene. Right? That would have been a good suspenseful scene. Because he's operating on the guy you while want him trying to get this gun. Yeah, you want while, him to. While trying to capture yeah. the gun and let yeah, it slowly also, slide down. Yes, if he was actively operating at the yeah, same while time. While he's doing it, that would have God, been so fucking cool. That would have been fucking sweet. Yeah, but Eli Roth can't pull that off. No, no, Eli Roth is a piece <laughs> of shit. So, anyway. <laughs> oh, no, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I may not like him, but. Uh, he's probably not a piece of shit. Yeah. You do get a montage in this. Um, that took back black. in black. Uh, Paul, we see, is using YouTube to learn about the Glock, how to take care of it, how to shoot it. Shoot it. Uh, we see you know, we, uh, more of this montage is him. Is, he's learning about gun care. He's in surgery. He's learning how to shoot the gun. It's important to note, one of the sequences in the montage that's actually really cool, and this is, I have to give the filmmakers credit on yep. this, he is pulling bullets out of people as he's putting bullets into the gun. Yeah. Yes. The sequence that he's doing, he's firing a gun as yeah, trauma patients like are sign. coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And like he's learning how to shoot it. He's, yes. he's slowly and meticulously. It's basically like he's applying his uh, his surgical skill yes. into like learning and being a better it, killer. To be the kind of surgeon Paul is, takes so much concentration in schooling. And it's almost like all the work he put into like getting, being a doctor, he's now putting into learning how to take care and shoot a Glock. Well, and the way that they're trying to equate it is by day, he's a life saver yeah. at night he'll be a life taker yeah exactly yeah but i mean and it, but it does show if you take like a person who works really hard to become especially like a surgeon who you know has to know so much and if they put that work ethic into anything else that they put in to learn how to be a surgeon they're probably gonna be really good at other shit too well it's like me when i became a coder and then i applied that that yeah. work ethic i had to do the schooling and work 40 hours a week at the same time yes i applied that to doing podcasting and became obsessive about 
learning everything I could. Exactly. And I quickly ramped up my audio engineering abilities it's while a, learning it. It's the same obsession I put into my drinking. <laughs> yes. It, I mean, I'm really <laughs> dedicated about it. And then when I got into crack cocaine, I put it into that. <laughs> By the way, I'm itchy. All over. I think I'm going to die. We'll shave your head later, buddy. It'll be fine. Okay. 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 <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, so uh, we now come to the hospital and we uh, learn Jordan had a stroke. Um, Which is pretty possible and does, is plausible. Like even when you have traumatic injuries, all it takes is a blood clot. Here's, an, here's another scene. It goes to the brain. That's yeah. it. And here's another scene where Willis kind of phoned it in with yeah. Vincent D'Onofrio. This was a big phoned it in scene. And Vincent D'Onofrio is another one of those actors yeah. who will give you everything. He's yes. very generous. And he is throwing fucking lofted balls I, to I him. Like, like, come on, buddy. You can get this. You can get this yeah, serve. This come on. This is so fucking mailed in. But and Willis is just not even trying. Scene. Yeah. Um, he just says, as every day goes by, her odds get worse of recovering the more she's like this. Um, Without geez. any emotion. With no emotion. And anything then he's like, at all. He sees her arms are in restraints probably because she was flopping around during the seizure. Which and does happen like, whenever you yeah, have he goes, seizures. Here's my babies in handcuffs. And I know. The animals who did this, they're out free. And it's I know, just like. It's so bad. Oh my God, man. I mean, too bad. This could have been a great scene if you would have woken up on the right side of the bed. I know. If he would have like felt like being a tryhard that day, that, that could have been a monster scene. But it fell so flat for me. It's just nothingness. Yeah. Yeah, you, it was really bad. At this point in the film, you're just like, well, you just fucking kill some people and get it over with I'm because like, you're not doing anything else right now. It, this is the first part of the movie, acting wise, where I was like, you know, don't get me wrong. We had the, psych, the psychiatrist, psychiatrist scene, couch, yeah. but it was so short that and it went back that I was like, I, I kind of forgot about it. But this scene was a bit longer. He's and at about 60 percent giving a fuck it, in the psychiatrist. scene. Yeah. He's at 20 percent in this scene. And I'm like, all right, in this fucking movie, because if he's like this for the rest of it, it's going to be fucking unwatchable. Yeah. I'm like, oh, my fucking God. I, I feel like if they came in and said your daughter's dead. OK, well, that's understandable. Thank you. And goodbye. And then he leaves End the movie. Yeah. I mean, holy yeah. shit. Yeah. You, you, could you care any less? Yeah. It's about as bad as Bronson and fucking Death Wish 5, where he seems to yeah. give even less of a fuck. Uh, hey, um, who, who died this time that I'm supposed to care about? My third cousin twice removed. No <laughs> dice. No dice. Um, so Paul that night decides to hit the streets and he's in a hoodie and all that. Uh, and he it's has his, a gray hoodie. Yeah. Yeah. And he has his gun with him while he's walking. He sees that there's a carjacking slash kidnapping because two guys grab this woman as she's getting into her SUV and are throwing her in a car. And as they're getting in a car, we get a, Hey, so they brought that back for the original. Cause yeah. he does, he does a, Hey, you know, like, you yeah. know, the same thing Bronson did. I love that. Uh, they start taking off the car and Paul starts shooting, uh, at the driver's well, they side. shoot at him and then yes, he drops down to but avoid driving, the shots. And, and then they start driving past him. When he first fires the gun because he's holding it wrong, it takes part of his skin off. And I think it's because when he was practicing, he was wearing gloves. If you ever noticed in the montage, oh, yeah? he wasn't barehanded when shooting. Yeah. So this is, I think, his first time shooting the gun barehanded. Well, I think Dean Norris's character points it out, too. There's a difference between target practice and shooting a gun in anger. Yes, that's right. And you right. don't know how to, if you don't practice holding a gun properly, yeah. when you shoot it in a hurry and out of anger. Well, anyway, take some skin off Paul, but he still it gets... It cuts his hand hardcore. Yeah, it's brutal. But he gets some good good enough shots off on the driver that the car crashes. Uh, as he's coming up, he, the girl's getting out and she's kind of screaming, of course, who wouldn't be. All the and, while you see someone videotaping him. Yes, yes. With their camera yeah. on their phone. And he tells her to get the hell out of there and she runs and the other guy comes out and he starts shooting Well, at she's Paul. terrified of Paul at first because yeah. he's there with a the gun and she's like, oh, no, no, no. And yeah. she's backing away and he's yeah, like, and he's like, he's like no, here. it's fine. It's fine. Just yeah. get out of here. Get out of and here. Paul takes cover behind a car while the guy's just shooting and the guy's but he's been in a car wreck so he's fucking not something's wrong with the, one of his eyes man. yeah like it looks like he took dash to the he, eye yeah so he's fucking or at least a concussion like there's or maybe maybe some of the shattered glass when Paul was shooting yeah. in there cut his eye or but something but he's, he's yelling and Paul then is able to kind of recover himself behind the car he gets up there plugs him a few times until he falls down and then Paul coldly walks over to him while he's over stands over him and shoots him in the head no he shoots him in the heart oh shoot yeah heart heart I'm sorry square in the heart yeah and then he goes to the driver's side and pretty much just watches that guy die and the guy's like uh, you know uh, the guy's like bleeding out he's coming out of his throat he tries to say something to him but I don't know what it is I think he's in why yeah maybe you you know almost like the fuck you mean why you're gonna do god knows what to that woman you know you're definitely carjacking 
fucking, you're probably going to rape her because you're a piece of shit. So, but he's like sitting there, what, what, what? And then he gurgles and he dies. <laughs> the only thing that that scene was missing that would have made it more of an Eli Roth film yeah. is if Paul Kersey started caressing his nipple watching the guy die <laughs> and then starts, uh -huh. his hand starts reaching south <laughs> as he's watching the guy die. Uh huh. Keep, keep gurgling. Keep gurgling. Keep asking me why. <laughs> keep asking. Because that's Eli Roth's that, taste. That's that what he Eli does. Um, we see uh, Paul trying to sleep you know, after all this, but he's, he's kind of having visions, you know, fam of his family, the murdering, all sorts of things. You can see cops are... If they're trying to recreate what happens with like the whole PTSD flashes where yeah. you've had some kind of traumatic thing, event that happens and your brain keeps replaying it, it, trying to deal with it and process it, was it. Weirdly put in. Oh, it was badly done. Yeah, That's what they're attempting to do. Badly done, yeah. but it seemed hammered in because then very, it lasts for maybe like a minute and then we go right to the back to the crime scene and the cops are interviewing the two detectives uh, are interviewing witnesses and that is our next clip I heard that girl screaming and then I heard tires squealing a whole bunch of shots and then a crash what about the shooter he looked like a white dude he had a hoodie it's the same description the couple gave outside white guy in a hoodie they called him a guardian angel yeah, more like a Grim Reaper. I mean, did you see how we stood over that guy and shot him? That shit was cold. Did you see his face? Mm -mm. Marks on his arms or tattoos. Mm -mm. So nothing that can help us. It was dark. He was shooting. Um, he kept waving his hand around like this. Like his hand got shot? I don't know. Watch the video. I mean, you've seen as much as I did. There. Mm. It doesn't look like it was shot. Mm. Now that is the slide kicking back and cutting his hand because he doesn't know how to hold a gun. So we're looking for a guy who never fired a gun? No, not in anger. Well, he has now. <laughs> Natasha, listen, we're going to need you to keep this video confidential, okay? No posting on social media and all that stuff you guys do. <laughs> I uploaded that shit hours ago. I'm getting hits like a motherfucker. Terrific. I love that. Terrific. Terrific. <laughs> yeah, Dean Norris plays that line so perfectly. <laughs> Just do it. I'm going to hit like a motherfucker. Terrific. Shit. I don't know if you recognize that actress who was performing that line where she's like, just a white guy in a hoodie and yeah, did uh, the phone recording yeah. or not. She was in Hemlock Grove. She was the main werewolf guy's cousin who was like a fake gypsy fortune teller kind of thing, but oh. actually did have some power as well. She showed up in The Strain for a little bit as well. She's been in a lot of TV, like the Mana High Castle and just everything like, like that. Just like bit parts. Kind, kind of, of or, or like a supporting cast yeah. and everything like that. Yeah. But I expect good things from this actress because she's very versatile in everything I've seen her and I'm like, holy uh, fuck, she just disappeared. She's like a character actor actress is yes. what I'm getting at. And she's really good at what she oh, does. I thought, I, I liked her. I, I liked yeah. I liked her demeanor in this. Yeah. Like, she I, steals I witness, that fucking scene, I'm man. a witness to a crime, but I'm sort of disinterested in talking to you already. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, Paul is uh, kind of obsessed almost with his new fame, or for what he did, because he's like... He's a serial watching. killer too. He's yeah. turning into a serial he, killer Because as now, well. he, I mean, he has a laptop open. He's, uh, he never moves from this couch when he's at home. He's got a laptop open with YouTube videos showing. He has his TV on that's running nothing but 24 7 news about this about yeah. this so he's like almost getting did you in anyway oh, fuck i can't say that word but in you inundated yes there you go uh with his own fame you know he's infatuated with what's going on yeah. he is obsessed but i think it's one of those things where he is trying to distract himself from what he's actually feeling and, and the news reports are helping him relive that high and this is where i come back to bruce willis he must have woke up on the wrong right side of the bed that day because he played like kind of almost creepy smile wide-eyed about all this really well like I got really unsettled watching this scene even though he didn't say a word just because he looked so fucking pleased with himself and you know almost just like in ecstasy about all this stuff I don't know if it's just the way that they edited it that they juxtaposed the stuff just enough to whatever facial expressions he had or if maybe he was having a good day but yeah he's doing this stuff rather well I yeah I, that. I like this scene um we I get a lot of radio chatter and news and that is is our next clip. The water cooler talk today on the Man Cow Show is everybody's watching this video, this viral video of this, this guy in the hoodie, they're calling him the Grim Reaper, that uh, shot these bad guys, these carjackers, according to witnesses. Right or wrong, I don't know. Good or bad, I don't know. I, I go back and forth on it. Is he a hero or a zero? That's a debate. We got calls coming in. The, the phones are lit up like a Christmas tree. I say the guys, and I, some people are mad at me, I say the guy's a hero. He stopped the carjacking. He is a hero. Is He's he a, a hero or thing. is he a zero? What do you think, Chicago? Call us right now. It's the Man Cal, and we want to hear from you. 
he saw somebody about to get jacked and a black couple at that power to the grim reaper yeah but i don't know about that i don't know that maybe that's the question we put out to the listeners okay is he right for taking the law into his own hands or is it wrong give us a call sway in the morning and shave four or five uh, fucking man cow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fucking man cow. That's those are legit yeah, radio those are programs. Those are legit right? radio person. Yeah, that like, Shay on X, Sirius XM. He was on MTV for the fucking longest. I know time. Shay. Yeah, yeah. I, I just yeah, but, man but, cow. I didn't know. Oh, you didn't know man? Yeah, yeah. I knew. I, I've heard man cow before, and uh, yeah, yeah, you out there. But <laughs> I mean, he's all right. <laughs> but I like the way that they're actually portraying this because this is what ends up happening, where the media is just doing this to draw in yeah. listeners, draw in conversation, and. I, and particularly morning radio. And what I love you is do the, this stuff where you piggyback onto the controversy or the latest news and you get people's opinion of it so you can keep people yeah. listening and, and talking. I, and I like they got actual radio people. Yeah. I, I like it when movies do that, when you're, you're having news and stuff and uh-huh. they're getting actual people that you've seen on the news and shit, like real people yeah. reporting. I just I like the there, realism. There is gives. a person in this film to where if they were not going to use real radio personalities that they could have absolutely used as a radio disc jockey uh-huh. and would have been fucking perfect. Yeah. And we're not, gonna, we're not there yet the guy oh. hasn't shown up so okay. when we get to him i'll be like that's him all right we see him taking care of the wound when he's walking and talking to a nurse and the cops are walking by it, it just regular two regular police officers he like puts his hands in his pocket instinctively yeah he fixes himself it. up he fixes up his hand but he knows that he needs to hide it because if anybody it, sees it most people are concerned it, about what happens to other people and why you're all bandaged up well and particularly not only, a doctor not only that but the two cops walking by because his what he did is such big news he knows everyone's going to be looking for someone with a, a cut right there uh, right on his left hand right where it is you yeah know? because the killer is left handed yeah so uh, he goes to check on a young boy who was shot in the leg uh, the young boy says you know he, he, you know, it's uh, the ice cream man that was in, even in the trailer and he goes you selling ice cream and the kid shakes his head and you know he says he sells drugs and he goes and you can't walk to school unless you work for the ice cream man and he said the next one won't be in my leg so Paul just looks at him and said you know what you're gonna be alright and uh, <laughs> we have another Bondy moment over this, basketball. This looks like a job for the I, angel of death. I like the way he acted in this scene, too. Yeah. No, I, I actually really liked Paul tried to make a connection. You know, they made a connection over basketball. and He has a soft spot for kids who are the victims of violence because he was a child raised in a violent household. Exactly. They play that off really well. Yeah, they maybe, really do. Maybe the news report scene in this scene was shot on the same day. It's possible. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the shit that, you know, he must have, you know, been doing well. Um. So... All right, well, it's, uh, so then it means that's death wishing time. So, <laughs> uh, we see the ice cream man. He's kind of sitting there, uh, and, uh, feet propped up on an old ice cream a, yeah, vendor, little vendor cart. thing, yeah. cart. And, you know, guys are coming. He's like selling, and, you know, he's talking to some guys, and, uh, they see Paul coming with his hood up. They like, look at this motherfucker. He goes, yeah, they all comment on yeah, it. Yeah, and they're like, what the, what the fuck do you want? And they all have their guns ready. And, well, the other know, guys have had their yeah. guns ready pretty much the whole entire time. But and, the uh, ice cream, ice cream man, man pulls out his his custom gun. gun. Yeah, and he's like, what the fuck do you want? He goes, oh. He goes, I'm uh, he, he, he looks like this. He goes, I'm uh, I'm your last customer. And he, he goes, you know, he goes, you the ice cream man? He goes, yeah, who, what the fuck do you want? He goes, oh, I'm your last customer. And he blows away the ice cream man and his two buddies. He puts about seven or eight shots in the guy before yeah. he kills the other two. Like, nobody has a chance to I react. I think the other two are just shocked that somebody actually killed the ice cream man. You know, yeah. like, so many underlings are like, well, this guy's so powerful, no one's gonna touch him. We have an easy job of protecting him. Yeah. And you don't think some white dude walking down the street probably is going to be much of a threat until <laughs> he is. <laughs> and then everyone's too busy to stop Paul because they're all stealing drugs out of the ice man's box. That's Well, and all the guys that would have stopped him are dead and everybody else has taken advantage yeah, to get the money that they can out so, of the But drugs. no one's looking at Paul. Yeah, no yeah, one cares because yeah. they're swarming the drugs. Yeah, they want the drugs. Yeah. And after that, we have more radio and TV debate. I almost made that a clip, but I'm like, fuck it, we already had enough. Yeah, well, uh, the radio and TV debate in this case is yeah. he's shooting a lot of black people. Yeah, He's uh, disproportionately killing a black man. But now. One, one of the, uh, that's what Shay is saying. You know, he's yeah. a white guy killing black people. But then the black lady on his show was like, "But these are drug dealers. These are carjackers. You yeah. know, these are not people who are helping out our yeah. communities at all." Yeah. And then Shay's like, "I don't know. You know." And but it's a good debate because you know, is should you be able to just go out and start shooting people on your own? Yes. Holy shit, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> this is this is where I would make a really weird detective. I'm sorry, that was real honesty there. I, I don't really know where to go from here. Listen, I'm going to get a cup of coffee and we'll pick this up later. Now, do I think everyone should be able to just to go out and kill? No, but, but should I? Yes. Oh, oh, see, yeah. No, see, that's not right. You asked me personally, should uh, I be able to just to go out and shoot whoever I want? Do you think anybody should be able to go out and shoot who they want? No. Okay. Now ask me again if I feel I should. I already know that answer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, well, we have detectives and the chief, and they are talking in our next clip. I'm getting calls from Houston, Detroit, New York. Everybody's nervous about a copycat. Where are we? Well, we assume the carjacking was random, mm -hmm. and our subject was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, but he got a taste for it. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to figure out how he selected the second victim, the drug dealer. Mm -hmm. uh, we also know he's left-handed, um, and we're pretty sure he's not in the system. Uh, we figured that out after the first shooting. Um, he had a lack of basic weapon skills, to say the least. Wow, great. And you've got to narrow down to about a million suspects. Detectives, get off your fucking asses. He's pissed. You want to tell me where we're going to start looking for our white needle in the haystack? Not where, but when. I mean, why now? What, uh... Let the fuse that set off our Mr. Reaper. Okay, now here's the guy I was talking about, the chief of detectives, yes. Stephen fucking McHattie. Yep. Mr. Grant Mazzy himself from Pontypool. Back on yes. the show. Back so good to have you, sir. Fucking love it, dude. I love this man's voice. Oh, it's so great. And he looks so different from when he was in Pontypool. I think he lost a little bit of weight. I think he well, looks he's getting older. I mean, yeah. You know. And that does happen. Because I barely recognized him until the very end. And I'm like, wait Holy fucking minute. shit. It's Stephen McHattie. Yeah, I'm like, hold on, wait a second second now yeah. from one of my I mean because that Pony Pool movie turned into one of my favorite zombie movies ever <laughs> I just I love the twist where it was words and shit like that yeah. and it was just fucking awesome yeah I love Stephen McCaddy I think he's fucking incredible and it was so nice to see him there now picture him being one of the DJs instead of Man Cow yeah instead of Sway he's there's, the DJ that's doing it there's the one time where I will accept like people have awesome voices yeah that's when I'll accept a fake news person yeah. doing the news no I like what they did that's one of the things that I like the most about this film where they have the media reaction, you know, where they have the actual newscaster guys mm -hmm. doing the discussion and using that to kind of frame and show how it's spreading through the city. It's one of my favorite parts of the original Ghostbusters during their montage when they really get going is they have all actual news people like Larry King's in that yeah, all yeah. And, and a lot of people maybe I don't recognize but I'm sure they're like New York City news people right? who you know, it, it just, it brings a certain level of realism to the movie Yeah, you know. And when something like Ghostbusters which is so ridiculous and preposterous. It, it you has, need something like that. To yeah, make you it need legit. something like that just to, you know, but it makes it fun. You know, yeah. it's it's really cool. Yeah, you're right. Uh, then we come to the therapist scene. We heard this in the preview where she's like, wow, you're looking really good. And he goes, yeah, you know, she goes, are you going out with people? And he goes, no, not yet. You know, like you said, it's a process, but I am getting out there. And she's like, well, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And he kind of laughs. He goes, okay. You know, he's a little bit more open in this they, one. They had to shoot wise. all of the therapist stuff all together because this scene really feels feels also like he's still phoning it in. It, well, that little laugh is almost like he's about to go, <laughs> fuck off, bitch. <laughs> Bruce fucking Willis. All right, so we go back to the OR and we see Miguel has been brought in from earlier in the movie and he is shot up pretty bad. MJ. Paul, yeah, Paul comes in and goes, I know this kid because he sees the MJ tattoo and he tries to save him. You know, he's eight, uh, uh, Paul hasn't really put two, to, two and two together yet about Miguel yet because at first he was like really shocked. He goes, I know this kid. You know, he's like kind of like, ah, oh, shit. Uh, how could a valet also also be a criminal. Yeah, right? Huh? Uh, anyway, but as he's trying to save him, we get he starts to have, we get flashbacks to him and his wife sitting there. And then as he looks up, he sees his watch on Miguel's wrist. So, okay, you're a shithead, Miguel. And uh, Miguel uh, dies and uh, Kirsten starts searching him and he finds, uh, Mig uh, or he starts, he goes to the ambulance that yeah. Miguel was brought in on and he finds Miguel's phone and his clothes that were in there. Yeah, like they took off his jacket to work on his chest or his shirt or whatever and his phone was in there. He brings it in and he uses Miguel's finger to access the phone because it's fingerprint access. Right. And then takes his watch back because fuck that shit. That's his watch. Yeah, right. Uh, he finds the pick of his address from his dashboard. Um, he uh, calls Detective Rings but hangs up when it goes to uh, voicemail. Uh, voicemail. And you actually hear that in uh, where he's kind of discussing and I think yeah. that, that does kind of show up. I don't know if it's in one of our clips but it might be in our trailer as yeah. well. But this is the demarcation 
point where the film stops being like the first Death Wish and moves into the second one. Yeah, where now he can find the people responsible. Right, for... and, and he's on a full-fledged vengeance kick. It's not just about trying to feel better by keeping other people from being victims. Yeah. It's about avenging the people that murdered his wife and put his daughter in a coma. Exactly. Um, as he starts going through the picks, he sees a picture of a liquor store. Well, first he actually sees a picture of his watch that says, so-and-so has your... Oh, yeah. Has this for you or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's and right. And then he sees the picture of the liquor store. That's right. That's that, right. That is so-and-so's liquor store. Yeah. Well, then we cut to uh, Brother Frank shows up and he's talking to him. And he's like, well, you look like shit. This was a really interesting thing where he goes to dart out of the room after finding that stuff. Yeah. And then like the brother and him are both equally scared. Yeah. And like two middle-aged men, they both grab their chest and go, oh, no, yeah. you scared the shit out of me. It, but uh, this is actually a really good scene. Bruce, uh, Willis must have woken up on the right side of the bed because this is a great scene where you know, the brother's like, come on, I'll, uh, you, you, uh, they had a funny little brother moment where you felt like they were brothers when he goes, you didn't sleep because you look like shit. And he goes, well, thank you very fucking much, doctor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dr. Frank. Yeah, Dr. Kersey. Frank Kersey. Yeah. I'm glad you could tell me that. You know, like yeah. you, you feel like they're having a brother moment. And he yeah. said, well, let me, I want to take you out. Yeah. My treat. I'm I'm taking you out. For I got once. a job now. I'm yeah. working. I'm now working I can again. Treat I want to, I want to take you out. We'll celebrate. I got a, uh, you know, union wages. So, you know, you can tell him must be a pretty good sweet deal. Yeah. Uh, and he's excited about it. And he's like, oh no, you know, maybe later. And then Paul, you know, Paul really wants to get going on this case and, and his brother just his, won't leave him alone. And he's pushing like, hey, then let's do lunch or yeah, something like that. I mean, let's, Friday. I'll let's Friday go out. Yeah, we'll, ce- we'll celebrate. I, I really want to take you and out. And then he yeah. goes like this. He goes, well, do you need money? You need help? Is that what this is? Do you, what do you need? Do you need help? And he is goes, that what you're wanting to go yeah, to lunch and with Yeah, and that's when Frank brings out an envelope because I actually just wanted to pay you back $2,000 you gave me. I was just excited I could pay you back. And yeah. he kind of leaves bummed out and you see Paul's kind of like, oh, I think this is the first time where Paul's like, what's, is this going to, you know, cost me my brother do now, you know, like my relationship with my brother because he feels like shit. You can yeah. tell he has that look. He's like, come on, Frank. He's trying to call to him. He's like, Frank. Yeah. And, he's well, like, and I think what it was is he wanted to take him out to lunch and he wanted it to be after a meal where he pays him back because he yeah. borrowed the money from a meal. Yeah. You know, and, and so he pays for the meal and then gives him a, a thing saying, this is two grand I owed you. Yeah. You know? and so it's, it's basically it's a big deal to Frank. You yeah. know, Frank's excited. He has a job again. Yeah. It's not that Frank he's wants back to be on a, his feet. He wants to show his brother that he's yeah. going to do okay. Frank doesn't want, you can tell you know, there's some, like in some movies where the, like the family member, the brother or the sister is a leech and they're, yeah. they kind of like it. Yeah. You know, they like being able to leech off of people. Right. Frank's not a leech. You know, he doesn't like this. He's doing it because he had to borrow money because he had to. And it's not a matter of being prideful. It's legit. He doesn't yeah. want to take advantage of his brother because he yeah. respects his brother and he wants his brother to see that he can do this and he wants his brother to be yeah. as proud of him as he is of him. And he doesn't view his brother as an ATM machine. He views his brother as his brother. Yeah. You know, he loves his brother. Yeah. And so he's de- he's like, I pay my yeah. brother back. I and love my brother. It's a really good fucking scene and it's all credited to Vincent D'Onofrio in this because he, he, he is really, giving I, everything. I, no, don't the look wrong. of hurt on his face yes. is amazing. Oh, it was so great. Yeah. I felt so bad. You're just I like, know. mother, you, fuck you, Paul. <laughs> just put the fucking gun down and go out to lunch with your fucking brother. You show the kingpin some respect. Yeah, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I felt, uh, yeah, and I thought Willis did a good job in this scene too. Uh, well, how could you not with yeah. as much as what D'Onofrio is giving? Like, loving up to all you. he has to do is just be a mirror for what D'Onofrio is giving. Especially when he's being all condescending, though. What do you need? What do you, you need? My, when he was doing that, I was like, God damn, that was fucking Paul. You're a dick. Yeah. I mean, you're like, God. Yo, you geez. can see how he views his brother, and it's the fact yeah. that his brother doesn't respect him more than anything that yeah. actually hurts uh, Frank more. Yes, exactly. Um, so anyway, uh, Paul goes down to like the, it's not a laundry room, almost like the trash room where you, all the clothes you took off victims are located. Yeah, if they yeah. have to remove something before they shoot someone and he tries to find and, something not covered in blood. Yeah, I couldn't tell if it was hospital trash or if it's like they're just waiting for people to go through it. But it's bags of shit. It's all closed. It may be things that came in that they're going to wash and then return later. Or or, or maybe they're waiting for cops to come if the cops want it. If you it's know. evidence or something yeah. like that, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, he finds a black hoodie and he puts that on and he heads to the liquor store. And it's really weird liquor store. In the back, when he heads to the back, it's, it, you, you go through these normal doors that you would think just lead to like a like a little back room. It leads to an actual bar slash bowling alley. It's a, you hear the bowling it's alley It's an go. old speakeasy. Yeah, and, but it has a whole bowling alley attached yeah, but, to that it. That was on the TV. That was wasn't that? Because yeah. I thought I saw all the bowling trophies and I thought you literally heard the bowling, but if that's coming from the TV, okay. Yeah. All right. Or it might be that the other side of it is a bowling alley that's yeah. owned by the same person who owns the liquor store and yeah. then there's just a line in between the two. It could be. I, yeah. I don't know. Either way, but it, it was actually, that's kind of cool. I was like, that's a cool way to do things. There's a lot of little hidden areas in this particular bar slash liquor store 
slash yes. maybe bowling alley. Something. Um, we see what uh, what we assume is the owner. He tells him, hey, you can't be back here. And uh, he goes, no, Miguel sent me. And he goes, Miguel, I don't know if fucking Miguel. Yeah, you know, he's a valet at the restaurant I own. And he's like, he said I could come down here and get something nice for my wife. He's got an MJ tattooed on his <laughs> forearm. Yeah. Really not trying at all. In not this at all. Scene. This is a not trying scene at all. Yeah. Uh, there's some old guy at the bar. The owner kind of sends him away. Uh, the owner's already suspicious. He's like, uh, it's the, oh yeah, uh, Miguel sent you, huh? I can get you something for your wife. Did is this uh, uh, anniversary? Well, at first this, he goes, he goes, he had a funny line. He goes, is this? I forgot our anniversary. Or oops, I fucked the babysitter. No, it's more of a something for an anniversary. Uh, Thank you for the years of service. Yeah. Or, a, or oops, I'm sorry, I fucked the babysitter. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Guy. Thank you for the years of service. I love yeah. that. Uh, uh, the, when he sends the guy away, I think he actually buys into it because the way that Willis is like, kind of like, I should be here. I was sent yeah. here. I still think he's a little suspicious. Though. Right. But, but anybody it, would be in this world. For this type of fencing I criminality. Th- yeah. I think if Paul wasn't even looking for vengeance, if it was just a guy coming in who was legitimately sent by Miguel yeah. to buy something, I think he'd get the same kind of, right. you know, aspect because you got to be careful selling all stolen goods. But the reason that he changes his tune and does the joking around is yeah. because he notices the tag on the, the sweatshirt and he knows something's up. Yes. That, and then he, the, and he because sees, I was just going to say that, he sees a hospital tag yeah. on the hoodie and he's like, all right, well, this, this already doesn't add up. Well, and because it's a hospital tag, they know that the last guy that got hit was a doctor. Yeah. Like, he knows that. Well, as he is behind the bar, Paul can see from uh, one of the mirrors, or like a reflection, that he's reaching for a gun. So Paul brings out his Glock and gets the jump on him. Well, he texts the guy that, he's, he's like, it says Fish or something like yeah, that. And he yeah, texts oh yeah. That, he texts, he, that doctor's he texts here, blah, a guy blah, blah. named Fish, that's also in here. From just, the thing the other night or I whatever. I fucking skipped a whole line. Yeah. Yeah, he said, I need, you know, he just texting a guy named Fish for probably backup. Then Paul sees him reaching for a gun. Paul gets the jump on him. He gets, you know, so the guy stabs gets, him in the fucking hand with yeah, a dart. Dart. Yeah. That was fucking awesome. awesome. Pulls out his gun and demands his shit back. Uh, so they go into the back and Paul's like, you know, where's all my shit? And he goes, it's, it's somewhere back here. I swear to fucking God, it's back here. And he's like, well, we better fucking find it. I don't it. organize like, it by all, house. Yeah. And he's like, what all, what is all this shit? And he's like throwing shit at him. Like, you know, he's now, do you think this guy just bought the shit and wasn't, he wasn't one of the three who uh, broke in? He's not one of the three who broke in. He's just a fence. Yeah. Which he does say later on. Yeah, I don't do any of this shit. I don't but break it's, in. It's like in The Crow where the, the bald guy that runs the pawn shop that buys all the stuff that yeah. the people that get murdered and he's, he's and mugged and, and all Fish that. And Fish is one of the three and he's yes. the link between the his gang and this right. guy. But the only thing that he had to go on was this pawn shop yeah. slash uh, stolen goods fence guy. Yes. And so then he finally, you know, they finally find Paul's shit and he's taking it. The guy knew where it was all the way. Yeah. It was a fucking safe. You had to yeah. open it up. And he's fucking just kind of, you know, Paul's like, cause I'll fucking, I'll end you right now. You know, and the guy's like freaking out. He goes, I don't do anything. I don't fucking kill anybody. I don't, I don't break in. He goes, I don't do the shit. All right. I just buy it. You know, it's like, I just yeah. buy it and I sell it. That's not a good enough excuse. No, it makes you pretty complacent in the murder and, yeah. and terrorizing of people. Yeah. Um, Fish does get there. And while taking a shot at Paul, ends up killing the guy by shooting him in the head. After I watch a movie and write down the notes, so I can always go back and correct names if I have to I go into Wikipedia uh-huh. the only thing they call him in Wikipedia is Ponytail Ponytail Pony- that makes sense I yeah. think that's actually that's his name on IMDB as well oh is it Ponytail All right. yeah so he kills Ponytail so sorry dude it's also important to note too like why does Paul Kersey care about getting items back they're just objects it's not gonna get his I, life back I think it's in your head you know it's you don't want anybody else holding on to this shit you want you know the, the, these things are the reason your family is dead you want them back you don't want other people holding them yeah I don't know, maybe, I guess. I just, it feels to me because, like, the other Paul Kersey gave no shits about yes. any material items at all. No. And I can see where he would want the watch that his wife gave him as a gift, and that's why he took it back from MJ. Yeah. But is he also trying to cover up the, his own tracks by getting this stuff back so that the people can't trace the criminals so that he can get to him and kill him in time? I think Ponytail is dead no matter what. There's no way Paul's leaving him alive. Right. Especially so, now that he's seen Paul's face. Yeah. So, I think he was dead, and yeah, if you take your stuff back, just your stuff, then there's no record of it ever being there and the cops can't say, oh, yeah. you know, what happened here? It's just the way that Willis is acting on this yeah. about my stuff, my I stuff. I think it, it just, just snapped. I think maybe it's a snap too. It's, yeah. You know, he's not, Paul Kersey right now is not in his right mind. He's. Uh, I just didn't like that scene. I know. I, I, I think enough. he's, so, his wife's dead. I think he solidly believes his daughter will never recover and she will die. I think that's what he thinks. Yeah. And so I think he's just kind of snapped. Yeah. Um. Anyway, they, we have a shootout between Paul and Fish. Paul is gun jammed. Yeah. And while they're kind of slowing around, uh, Fish
slips on the blood of Ponytail. He falls. Paul picks up a guitar, s- s- swings it right across his uh, head. Not just any guitar, but yeah. a BC Rich Warlock. No. <laughs> See, I don't that know. Is, that is a fucking black metal classic it, and, and death metal. It's, and, a, it's a beast of a guitar, and yeah. he slams it right over the guy's head. Yeah. Um. Then he dumps an entire rack on the guy. Uh, uh, Fish is able to get away. Then he goes back to get his gun. He unjams it, but Fish is able to get out from there, and he kind of runs outside. So now Paul's in like the fish is outside of the bar behind the bar while Paul's in the back area like behind a wall and they're kind of having another shootout trying to see and Paul's using the security yes. footage to know where fish Paul, is Paul uh, uses a uh, security footage he sees it and he's able to shoot through the bar hitting fish in the leg now fish is laying there and he's like I'll, I'll give up I'll, I'll tell you Joey Joey's the one who did it. I didn't shoot anybody yeah so we can already tell fish is the probably the guy who went searching for the rope if fish is the guy who went yeah. searching for the rope you can tell by his voice yes and he's also out of bullets it's not just that he's shot but he's also out of bullets too yes and, and that's why he starts giving the guy and up. he's like i'll give you joey um he says he was like joey's the one who did all the, the shooting he's the one who i think he says he, joey's the one who shot your daughter is what he said he's like joey's the one who shot the, the, the girl or he just says show he at least says joey he sold joey out as the shooter yeah he said joey did this and uh he's fucking he shot him and uh at that point uh during the interrogation he's like yeah yeah and then somehow uh, fish while well, paul's like not paying attention he's kind of being like Paul, Paul is standing on a, the gun the to try and get yeah. him to talk and then Paul backs off a little bit to try and get the information and the guy uses the opening yeah. and he th- can, th- kind of kicks, kicks him in the Paul, junk kicks him in the junk and Paul falls hard against the wall falls down loses his own gun underneath him while he's reaching for it he um, hurts his arm on the bar like yeah. he hits on the bar or something like fish, that as he falls I don't know if he's out of ammo because Fish is able to grab or there, there's another gun laying around or no, he, no, he had a he, second gun he had a uh, oh, that, ankle that's holster right. he had yeah. the ankle holster yeah. he kicks out he goes you dumb son of a bitch as you get ready to kill him a bowling ball falls on his head he falls on top of Paul who had gotten a hold of his gun and blows well, no, Fish's brains out Fish falls with the gun in his hand and Paul and oh. as he's falling he shoots himself in the head oh does, is that what I thought yeah. Paul was it see I could barely tell yeah. in all the commotion of it I, I thought, watched that scene several times because okay, it's still thought, fucking gross it was fucking, cool. it was fucking awesome I yeah. loved it we'll, we'll get into it let me just finish yeah go ahead I just thought he was able to reach underneath the bar and had his gun no and then okay but either way how fucking awesome was it with his <laughs> head just explodes from the back yeah i was like that was so fucking cool it was great occasionally eli roth will do some cool shit yeah yeah All when right. it comes to gore he knows what he's doing eli roth you're not such a piece of shit <laughs> Then we come to a scene, which is actually kind of cool, where Paul's watching a YouTube video of how to destroy a hard drive. Well, how to make the data less easy to read. Yeah, well, it's pretty much destroying a hard drive so that, yeah, it does make it really hard to read. And then he, you, we see him come out of his house with a, his trash. So he's destroying everything he used to like learn how to use a gun or anything. It's also important to note that when Paul walks out after getting all beat up at the bar, he drops his class ring right there in the middle of the floor. Oh, my God. I almost, yes. And once again, yeah. I skipped a line. Yes, yeah. he does. Uh, his class ring was one of the things stolen from Stanford. Yeah. And that fell on the floor. Sorry. All right. Uh, and that's we, why he's destroying the data because he thinks yeah. it's going to come back on him. Yeah. Yeah. So we come to more news and debate and that is our next clip. Reaper alert. Reaper alert. Reaper alert. Where's the, where's the, where's the Reaper? The Grim Reaper strikes again, this time in the Pilsen neighborhood. In front of this liquor store, which was a fencing operation for stolen goods. Not anymore when last night the Grim Reaper paid them a visit. Dude, I look over, I see this dude walking out. This this old white dude, and he's walking with his hood up, you know, looking super suspicious, just like, you know, like trying to idolize him. Man, right now, this dude is all over the internet, man. There's memes coming up, Get you know. Out of here. Uh, yeah, there's memes. Like, people are making memes. Look at this one right here. Oh, that's too intense. Oh, that's good. He's become a folk hero. He's a real hero to these people that are being affected by all this crime in their neighborhood. As brother, long as it's not in your neighborhood. Brother, brother. Clearly, if he didn't just kill somebody, I don't know what he did. I'm, I still stand by the, my, my point that we're normalizing dangerous behavior. Yeah. You know, should we be policing ourselves in our own neighborhoods? I have said we need a guy like Grim Reaper for years. Are you Team Reaper or not? The one thing this movie does so well is it hits home so well about the media blitz that ends up happening in these types of things where everybody makes it a political talking point. And also how our kind of internet driven society goes like when they tell them about their memes already. Yeah. Because that would be like if something like this happened, the first thing that would happen is some fucking internet trolls are going to start making memes about it. Yeah. Yeah. And the memes that they end up showing look so legit about something that someone would do. Our entire audience would start making memes almost instantly and posting them to the page. (laughs) 
Well, I don't know about the Grim Reaper thing, but yeah, they would probably do something similar. Are you kidding similar. me? Art? Yeah, come on. But don't talk down about our audience. I'm not talking down about our audience. They would do it. They're, They're the fucking only people awesome. that love us. I know. <laughs> Including my own parents. Oh, man. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. My head's just Are you tattooing yourself? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anything to get rid of this fucking headache. Well, that's some good uh, art there, man. That's You're doing a really good job over there. <laughs> well, that looks nice. That'll be tasteful. That's a, I'm good at self-mutilation. That's a, that's a tasteful dagger with blood dripping from it. No, that's a real dagger. I'm just stabbing my arm now. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so high right now. Everything looks like a cartoon. All right. So detectives stop by Paul's office and are... It, 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 this scene's great. I'm just going to preemptively say this. Uh, Paul hides his hand the entire time. If you ever notice it. Yeah, he's really his good at keeping it His left hand never yeah. comes up from his chamber. Even though he's left-handed, yeah. Yeah. So they talked to him about how they found fish in that he had Paul's ring and that they believe they're really close now. He goes, this is the break we needed because now we can check all his known associates who he works with like anything like that because he does have a record and we're really close we'll be cl- we're close to getting the rest and he says Dean Norris plays that yeah. really well when he's, he's, he's like, leaving he goes see I told you just have to have faith like but he's serious about that he's like we're gonna get these guys yeah. he's, he's legitimately like this is a case that I'm very invested in even though there's not much that I can do yeah. we're getting closer and all it's gonna take is for the rest of these guys to give them up yeah and he's like we're gonna, this gonna, we're gonna be fine he goes I, I, know, I just want to come by here personally because he goes I know you're frustrated I think you really felt for Paul. Yeah. I think he felt for Paul for losing his wife and you know yeah. kid. And, and he's legit daughter. trying to make a show of solidarity yeah. and support for a victim of crime. Like yeah. up until this point, he is still a good cop. He's still doing what an idolized cop should be doing. Yeah, like this is the he's ideal. To yeah, fight crime. Um, after after they leave, Paul brings out both the cell phones. The because he took Fish's cell phone too. Yeah, and he? they they end up telling him too that they got yeah. a warrant for Fish's cell phone, yeah. his records, and even the GPS, which means they're gonna find that he has the phone. So he destroyed both the phones Miguel's and Fish's yeah uh, he doesn't have to smash it all he has to do is fucking throw it into a bunch of water I, it, dude, yeah. it's the dramatic yeah. smashing of the phone yeah. everybody likes to smash the phone uh, alright okay so we come to Joey at his body shop working on a car and this is going to be a pretty fucking awesome scene this is Eli Roth being Eli yeah. Roth yes yeah. so as he looks up he sees Paul's cursing and goes hey didn't I tell you we're closed Paul break, picks up a big wrench and knocks him out yeah he doesn't just knock him out he hits yeah. him in like the stomach or the jaw and makes so, him hit his own head on yeah, the car. Yeah. Which is pretty awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> uh, when Joey comes to, he's strapped down underneath a super jacked up car. Like the car is way, way jacked up. Like a 45 degree angle almost. It's yes. really up there, yeah. Uh, Kersey then says, well, uh, he's uh, he's restrained and Paul goes, you know what this, uh, he breaks out a scalpel and he ejects him with something. Uh, fucking, I don't know. It's something that, it's a paralytic is what yeah. he's doing. He's trying to make he it goes, to where the guy can feel but he won't be able to move. Yes. And so he goes, no, this is going to be bad. And he proceeds to cut into his sciatic fucking nerve and you see it happening and all the tears and it's like tough for even Paul to tear. And he goes, this is like one of the toughest nerves and it's the biggest nerve and it's the most pain you can feel without your heart failing. Well, when he dumps the caustic agent on yes. there, he says, this is, we were told in medical school that this is the most pain a human body can endure without going into and cardiac he pours arrest. brake fluid into the wound and the you wound see it sizzling, sizzling up and, and burning. And foaming up. Oh, it's so grody, dude. It's so grody. But this guy deserves it because also Joey has the scar in his face from where Jordan cut him. Joey's a fucky, rapey piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. So Joey's getting everything he deserves in life. Well, yeah, you don't feel bad about it, but you know. But and I I also, you also kind of know from what Fish was saying, it's implied that everything that was bad that happened to Jordan is this guy's fault. Yes. Which is why Kersey's going the extra mile to torture him. And also he needs the info. Yeah. And so you don't feel bad for this guy getting this at all. He wants to know who who else like, was there and was, was there. involved. And he goes, just one. And he, of course, in so much pain, he gives up the name Knox. He goes, what's his first name? He goes, no one knows his first name. His name's fucking Knox. He hangs out on the north side. He's like, give him, he goes, it's a lot of vague, but he's like, no one knows. And that's the whole deal with Knox. You don't know Knox. And when it's time for him to get a job with you, yeah. he finds you or something like that. And Kersey says, okay, I, I believe you. And uh, he unstraps him and begins to leave. And he says that the paralytic thing is going to be wearing off yeah. shortly. 
apparently anyway. Yeah. And Knox is able to kind of roll himself off the bed he was on. So he's on his stomach and he looks up and he goes, you know, it was gonna- a, it was a creeper that goes yeah. underneath cars that he had yeah, he strapped goes, to. You're not going to kill me. And then we heard this in the trailer. He goes, no, the Jack is and Kersey pulls the chain and the Jack falls, car falls, busting open Joey's fucking head. It was so awesome. Yeah. The engine block just fucking yeah. destroys his oh, head. Oh. Sends, sends shards of junk everywhere. It's out of his brain. so great. That was yeah. a great scene. That yeah. whole scene was so fucking awesome. <laughs> Once again, Eli Roth, well done. You did a good job. <laughs> and Bruce Willis plays that scene pretty well, too. It seems yeah. like he gave a shit about he torturing gave, a guy this gave, one. Yeah, I mean, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what Bruce Willis wants to do to everybody in his normal life. <laughs> Cut open their sciatic nerve and dump <laughs> brake fluid on there? Probably. <laughs> You don't have a very high opinion of Bruce Willis. Actually, I do. I like him a lot. You're just terrified by him. Yes. <laughs> I like him a lot, and that's why it depresses me when I see him mail in and, and hear, phone it in, yeah. Phone it in and hear about how much of a fucking like asshole he can be on set because yeah. I want to like Bruce Willis. <laughs> you don't want him to be Chevy Chasing you. I, yeah, don't Chevy Chase me, man, because I like everything Chevy Chase is in. It just you can't ruin it for me, all right? <laughs> don't do this to me. Don't Chevy Chase me, Bruce Willis. <laughs> don't you Chevy Chase me. That's gonna become a new lexicon yeah it's a new verb <laughs> chevy chasing it yep. <laughs> oh man uh all right the detectives uh show up and we see paul's brother's frank is uh batting in a, a batting cage and they come to question him you know they like hey you could have been in the majors and all that and paul's brother and frank's like hey, what, do you, what do you want my autograph you already knows that somebody's yeah being a dick hey, something we should go back earlier and i can't believe i, I missed it I'm, I'm i'm skipping lines like a motherfucker on this and i'm not using my pen as well as i should i'm sorry um, during the scene where Frank gets his feelings hurt by Paul, Frank notices the cut on Paul's left hand. Yeah, he does. Yeah. So I want to say this. So anyway, as they're talking to Frank about, you know, they they kind of think he's the Grim Reaper. And he goes through all of this. And who's the street smart guy who would know how to get things done and want to take law into his own hands? Who also happens to be a southpaw. Yeah. It, it also happens to be left-handed. He goes, so what I'm trying to say is, can I see your left hand? And that's, you see Frank get this, like, look of fear. Not that he's afraid the cops are going to catch him because his hands are obviously fine. Yeah, and he knows but he's not doing it, but... He knows his brother Paul is now the Grim Reaper. Yeah, he knows something's up. Yeah, well, not something up. He knows Paul's the Grim Reaper. That's, he knows. And he's mean, terrified for his brother and yes, his safety now knowing that he's doing this you know, he's, shit. Yeah, he's just scared for his brother's safety because, yeah. you know, he's lost a sister-in-law. He, he thinks, much like Paul thinks, they're going to lose, lose his, niece, his yeah. niece, and now he's going to lose his brother. All his family is going to be gone now. And every every family that he loves, yeah. yeah. And uh, so anyway... It's important to note, too, his character is extremely hostile to the cops still. Yes, he is very hostile. Very like, you know, oh, you're doing a great job. Whoa, you want my autograph. Oh, sounds like you're doing great work. You know, all this kind of shit, like really condescending yeah. to the two of both. Um, I love that. Every yeah. minute of it. <laughs> Even though these are two decent cops, they're yeah. actually doing what they should be doing. Yeah. So far. So far. Uh, we see a, a girl getting attacked in, uh, in an alleyway and uh, we see a hoodie man rushing up and uh, as he says, hey, uh, the guy, the assailant turned turns around and shoots the man three times in the hoodie. So uh, we cut to Paul is with his daughter and he's watching the news and we see that this was a copycat. And this copycat vigilante uh, or Grim Reaper, because they don't use vigilante here, the Grim Reaper, is a father of three. And so see Paul is kind of like a little bothered by it. Like he turns off the news and he's not really, he's maybe even starting to rethink maybe I should stop this because I, that's what I get, like his facial expression. He kind of got this feeling like maybe he shouldn't go after Knox. Like, you know, maybe Maybe it's like I'm doing more harm than good because now a, a father of three just got shot trying to be me, you know, and yeah. he's dead. Well, uh, I got nothing left to lose because my daughter could die any day now, so yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, he uh, keeps getting phone calls and he's ignoring it. Then he gets a text to answer or the person will tell the cops they know where he was the night before. Yeah. So he answers it and it is Knox and he wants to meet at a club and he goes, why would I do that? He goes, quite simple. It's safe. There's people there and I want to tell you what your wife's last words were. So be there 30 minutes and it's like oh well then then any thought Paul had to you know not doing that you know not going back out yeah. well now he's gonna kill Knox anyway yeah you know, I don't and it's not even the threat of the cop it's the fact that Knox said I want to tell you what your wife's last, last words, words were, were yeah. that okay and then, you know that's just I'm gonna fucking kill this guy too yeah well it's clear that Knox is the one that killed his wife yes. and the other guy killed his well shot his daughter yeah so but the, yeah and, and so and he knows Knox is the brains behind everything so apparently because obviously fish had none no no. He's just a big lummox. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and he definitely has no brains now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but at least
least Fish had some honor compared to the other guy that got yeah, fucking yeah. brained by the car well, that's block. What, that's why Fish got a, a relatively painless death compared to what Joey got. Yeah, no kidding. Um, Frank goes to the, the club, and as he's looking for him, he's going through, he's got his hoodie on, and he's going through, and his massive amounts of people. It's a pack night. Uh, he gets a text to go into the bathroom, because he's like, where are you? And he's like, I'm in the bathroom. So he goes in there. And it's this giant unisex fucking Roman style bathroom. Yeah. And he dials the number. Paul does. And he hears the ringing behind one of the stalls. So he shoots out the stall. As he opens it, he sees it's just a phone tape there. He's been duped. Knox then shows up behind him with a, a human shield. If you look, he was the one making out with the girl that yes. Paul eyes up. That's right. Before he decides just to make the call. Yes. And the guy was using the girl as a human shield. So he spun her around right after yes. he took and the shots. Threw in a hail of bullets. Paul is able to get into one of the stalls and hits the ground. He gets shot he gets on the way down. Shot. It gets grazed with the bullet. Yeah, yeah, with a bullet. But it's a pretty severe graze. Uh, Paul starts shooting him. Or Paul starts looking around. He's like, fuck, fuck, fuck. And the girl kind of elbows Knox. And at the same time, Paul kicks open the door. And Paul's able to get a shot off onto Knox in the gut. Yeah. But then Knox grabs another guy as another human shield and starts shooting again. And Paul is pretty much stuck. So he looks up, sees an electrical box, shoots out the lights. So all the lights go out because he blows up the electrical box. That's convenient. And uh, <laughs> it's dark. Paul and Knox are both able to uh, get away. But it's a, it's a mess of bullets. Another guy got shot in the shoulder by Knox, you know. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's important to note that Paul timed his shots out well and made sure he didn't hit any innocent yes. bystanders. Paul didn't Knox hit anybody. Knox is spraying and praying. Yeah, well, because Knox doesn't give a shit. Well, why would he? Yeah. He wants um, this guy dead so he can live his life. Yeah. Uh, Paul escapes. You know, there's a big rush, of course. Paul's able to escape within the, the crowd of people. Knox can't get away at all because it's hard to walk with a fucking gut shot. Yeah. So he's obviously going to get picked up by the uh, hospital. Um, as the, the 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 two detectives show up to the hospital, they're, you know, they're like, this might be one of our best chances to find out. And one of the nurses comes up and they goes, uh, this guy says he knows who the Reaper is. And the two detectives, and it's Knox. And he, Knox is getting ready to give up Paul Kersey because that's Knox knows it's him. So, yeah. Um, Paul, we see him fixing himself. This is a painful scene. We're stapling his own wound fucking shut. Well, he throws it. He dumps in a bunch of antiseptic, which yeah. hurts like hell. Uh-huh. And then I think he throws in some of that like medical glue stuff. Yes, and it's then medical he's trying to, glue. Yeah. And then he has med- and stapling. Yeah. Fuck. Ow. That hurts. And here again, we see Bruce Willis playing it straight and doing a good job yeah. with, with making the pain look real. Yeah. Because he's like, fuck. You know, like <laughs> one of the few times Paul Kersey swears. And yeah. So, you know, yeah. it means something because he's like, fuck. That yeah. hurts. You know, brother Frank shows up to the house and that is our next clip. Well, what are you going to do? Shoot me too? What are you doing here? What am I doing here? What are you doing here? What is this, your little war room? Don't you judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm worried about you. You, you can't do this. Paul, you're not a cop. Then somebody has to do it. My wife and daughter just disappear and there's no consequences. I did everything I was supposed to do. Everything. I worked hard. I obeyed the law. I made a life for my family, for my wife and daughter. And what, they just forget about that? They're just gone now? You need to leave now, Frank. I don't want you to be part of this. Hey, 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 hey. I'm already a part of it. Stay, stay, stay. It isn't Chicago's finest. Oh, Frank, you're expecting your brother. Yeah, he's out. Dinner party. Why, what's up? Well, he could be in real trouble. Believe it or not, we want to help. That's so sweet. I appreciate your concern, detective. Like I said, when I see him, I'll tell him. That was some bullshit. (laughs) But we're not arresting the surgeon without ironclad proof. Well, the good news is I'm not a suspect anymore. The bad news is is I'm not a suspect anymore. Paul, this has to end. It's got to end, man. I don't want to have to bury you next to your wife. You're not going to bury me. All right, we got to figure this out. If, if there's anything the cops can find, you know, there were cameras in the club. I kept my head down the whole time. Where's your car? Near the hospital. Okay, you, you, you got to get it before the police start checking tags. Okay. Who'd be calling at 2.30 in the morning? Let's see. It's the hospital. Hello. Thank you. I'll be right there. It's Jordan. She's awake. All right, I think in that scene too, it's one of those bad there's, days. There's where a he's lo- not giving yeah, it. He's that not that giving one especially. The he was good in the expl. It's almost like the same scene was shot on different days because when he's going through the like my family, you know, I, I built this life. I bought that. That was great. Oh yeah. But the moment when it's like my daughter's out of coma, I've got to go. It's yeah, like, yeah. That that was the one that fell flat. It but, felt like he was phoning it in for the whole thing for me. Really? Okay. I personally liked the other scene, but once again, I think it's I D'Onofrio. Like, you're 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 feeling D'Onofrio's. Yeah. 
oh my acting. God. It's projecting right through you. There's so much to unpack with D'Onofrio at the cop seat. Oh, it's Chicago's finest. <laughs> we, believe it or not, we want to help. Oh, thank God. <laughs> oh my, like you, D'Onofrio plays asshole so fucking well. Condescending yeah. asshole yeah. so fucking well. Yeah. Oh, he plays everything so fucking well. Oh, he's and amazing. Yeah. Once again, I'm probably, my love for Bruce Willis is blinding me maybe to that because I thought Possibly. he nailed that scene yeah. pretty well. Until, but, but I will admit, the whole, when he gets a phone call about his daughter, yeah. and then I'm like, was this shot on a different day? Because yeah, that was so, that wasn't like excited or yeah. anything. It was, okay, my daughter is no longer in coma. I must go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also wanted to point out, and I'm sorry, I, I missed out on this, that Frank actually went to Paul's place and yeah. went to his basement and saw where he's been living. And, and, and how because, he's been living with we, the, the we, food takeout yeah, everywhere and We haven't gotten everywhere. to see it because the lights are always out and only the TV's on. But it's not even like, I, I always I was like thinking Paul was in like his living room on the couch. Paul isn't even in, in the main part of the house. He's in his basement. Yeah. And that's where he lives. And yeah, it's a mess. And there's shell casings and bullets everywhere and fucking food everywhere. It's fucking horrible. And, and Vincent D'Onofrio's acting where there's no words. Or yeah. no, he does, there is one where he's like, Paul. Yeah. Oh, Paul. Like, it, But it's really heavy. And I really like that. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. I enjoyed that a there's lot. There's moments of this film that are really good. And then there's other moments that are super frustrating that yeah. are well, it's, that are so when bad. When Bruce Willis is phoning it in. Well, it, there's other parts too where yeah. like the editing and some other yeah. things too that well, are Well, there's some weird scenes that are cut in there. Yeah. That, there's some bits of this movie that like could have achieved some real good status. It was really well done and then yeah. other parts it just fails miserably. Uh, well, they go to the hospital uh, and um, Jordan is waking up and she just keeps asking where her mom is. And she's like, Dad, they won't tell me where mom is. And she's starting to cry, I think, realizing that you know mom's not around. And uh, Frank leaves the room. I think Frank's like, this is probably not where I should be right now. Oh, uh, well, Frank is too heartbroken to see yeah. his niece in that state and yeah. just to relive all the grief I think that again. that murders him in, in, in the inside to see yeah, her he crying like that. a little bit inside, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. he, he very clearly very much loves his niece. He loves his... Yeah. I, I think Frank knows he'll never have a family of his own, so that niece is as good of a daughter to him. Yeah. So I think that just kills him in a in a way, you know? Yeah. Paul walks into his office and Frank's asleep, but he wakes up, you know, asking how she's been, and he's pretty much like, you know, well, she just pretty much... He goes, physically, I can take her home in a week. Mentally, she just found out her mother was murdered. Yeah. You know, so... There's nothing worse than waking up from a violent incident like that and whatever you can remember and then realizing that you'll never see your mom again because of it. Frank gets real serious here with Paul and there's another again, once a great acting job by Vincent D'Onofrio where he's like, listen man, she needs you now. She and needs I, her father. What I love is not this other thing that you've become. Not and this I other guy. Yeah. He, he didn't even say guy. He says thing. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, he like makes it so that it's like a monster. He's like, he doesn't need this thing that you are now, but she needs her dad. And Paul says, all right, it's over. And Paul's like, I agree. It's over. Paul's not going to drop it. It's done. Um, well, so, he has something to live for now. Yeah. His daughter's alive and he needs to be a father again. So uh, Jordan, uh, it's time for Jordan to go home. And as he's wheeling her out, the detectives, once again, uh, kind of like, or anything you can remember. And she's like, I, I can't remember anything other than going upstairs to grab the iPad. That was like the last thing she remembered. Yeah. She, she doesn't even remember being held hostage. I think traumatically that was blocked out. And then yeah. also whatever damage the coma did probably yeah. wiped away a good portion. Of exactly. It. Um, so then uh, they get in the elevator. And another guy gets in the elevator and it's fucking Knox. Yep. And he goes, oh, going home? And she goes, I'm going home today. And he goes, oh, that's nice. That's nice. He goes, so what happened to you? She goes, oh, you know, I was just, I think she says. I, I was in an accident. an accident. Yeah, I was in an accident. He goes, oh, well, looks like you're getting better. I'm happy. And she goes, what happened to you? He goes, oh, I was shot. And all the while, Paul's not even looking at Knox. He looks in straight ahead. And I really like that. I like that he's just like, I'll fucking kill you in this elevator. But he wasn't, doesn't want to give anything up. Yeah, you see him tensed but holding it back because he doesn't want to scare his daughter and let on that he yeah. knows what's going on. And he's like, oh, well, you know, as they're leaving, he goes, you take care of little like little girl or some shit like that. No, he that. says, so, see you later, Dr. Curzon. Well, at yeah. the very end, yeah. but he does tell her to take care of like, yeah. little girl. And as they're walking out, he goes, I'll see you around, Dr. Kersey. And she's like, dad, who was that? And I go, he goes, I don't know, baby. It was somebody else's patient. Yeah, some yeah. other, some other, someone else's patient as in yeah. the other guy's going to take care of this. Yeah, so uh, Paul then rushes back to the gun store and he goes, I need to buy a gun. And that's what the lady goes, don't I remember you? Yeah. So Paul now wants a fucking gun. Well, and what he's doing now is because his mode is switched, he doesn't care if the stuff is traceable to him because now he's in defend your family. Yeah, 
Yes. Now you say, oh, they're going to come after me so I yeah. can now legally defend myself. Now, would they have come after her when she comes to because she might recognize them? Or is this vengeance for him? It's vengeance after? for him coming, like taking out some members of his gang that's going to cause trouble for him. You putting know, putting a bullet in his gut. Putting yeah. a bullet in Yeah. Well, Knox is definitely the type of guy where if you shoot him and don't kill him, he's going to probably come after you no matter what. Yeah. So he's after Kersey more than the daughter at this point? Yeah, I believe so. And this is vengeance where whatever happens to the daughter is for him specifically to get. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So uh, that night, uh, they're all having dinner together, Frank, Paul, and uh, Jordan. And she's like, you know, I have some more physical therapy just so my body can learn what it needs to do again. Yeah, there's some stuff that's going to have to relearn, which is what makes me think that maybe she did get shot in the head. Something must have happened, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Frank leaves, and as, you know, everyone's getting ready to wind down the night, as Paul's going upstairs, he looks out the window, and he sees two men running across his yard. And so he goes, hey, Jordan, come here for a second. He's trying to be really calm for her. Like, help me move this, sweetie. Yeah, help, yeah. help me move this sweetie dad what's going on he goes all right i just want you i just want you to get underneath here underneath the stairs because dad why what are you be, doing it's, it's gonna be a goes, fun game just goes, get under the yeah, stairs he goes i found i just saw a guy run across the yard she goes you did he goes but don't panic i just want you to go downstairs i just want to get underneath here and you call, call the, the police yeah. call the police she goes okay and, and no matter what you stay in here yeah, no matter what you stay in here so uh does paul cut the power or do they no paul pushes her into, into the room and then pushes the thing up against it to yeah. hold the door shut and to block the door and hide it but i know the house is dark yeah of right now. I think they cut the power. Yeah, somebody cuts the power or something. Yeah. So as the two guys are going through, one guy comes up and he comes walking into, like, as their case in the house, he comes walking into the bathroom and Paul shoots him pretty easily with a gun and Well, kills Paul him. has the shower going and yes. he's hiding underneath the bed and he kills that guy. Yeah. And then he kills another guy and he kills the second suspect. He kills pretty much the two thugs with Knox easily. Well, like, there's no even problem. The way the second guy dies is fucking amazing. Yeah. So we have to talk okay. about that. All right, so the first guy, he ends up just kind of duping, and he shoots him straight in the head. Yeah. Then he takes his easy scorpion or whatever yeah. it is. It's a nine millimeter, like, it's supposed to be a pistol, but it's basically a short-barreled rifle without a stock. Yeah. Is what it is. Uh -huh. And he has both of those guns, and he's got the guy laying down on the ground by his bed, and he's hiding under the bed. That's right. The other right. guy comes in, and he unloads the, 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 the perp's gun and his own gun on the guy. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't necessarily kill him, but the guy falls over the banister backwards yes! and lands on his fucking head and snaps his neck right in front. Of awesome. Jordan. Yes, snap. And she's yeah. just like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's coming down and he's like whispering to her. He goes, don't worry. Yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. I am fine. So all the gunshots you heard, I'm not dead. Yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. Just call the cop. Yeah. They end up in the basement. And well, he goes down to yeah. the basement and, and Knox gets the jump on him and actually shoots Paul in the shoulder. Yeah. And then he's kind of, he has the gun trained on him. And Knox is like, you know, if you're, you wonder what it's going to be like to listen to your daughter burn. Or he goes, do you have your heard someone burned to death well his uh the shot that happens then yeah. the daughter screams out so he now knows that the daughter's upstairs yes from where they're at and then he goes, uh, have you ever heard someone burned to death yeah and then he's you're like about because he goes you're gonna listen to your daughter burned to death yeah he goes because he goes just get ready dr Kersey. and as he screams more he uh well she's trying to work her way down to save her dad she yeah. breaks herself out of the cabinet yeah. screaming and he's turning around to go then, get her. well he has enough of a distraction when he looks upstairs hearing her scream that the table of foreshadowing opens up and there's an M16. Paul brings it out and is it an M16? It's, a, it's an Armalite yeah. rifle. It's yeah. it's an AR-15 it type looks, rifle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but he brings it out and he blows Knox away to the point Knox is like up against the wall and he's like, He puts it. a fucking clip in him. Yeah. He unloads into it. Not into yeah. his head. All body shots, man. Yeah. So you get to bleed out. No instant death for you. <laughs> you yeah. Well, he does that on purpose. I'm yes. sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then he just kind of stands there and watches him die and that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> again, pinches his nipple and yeah. then works <laughs> his he, hand down. He does. He has a real creepy smile when he's watching him. Just the life start draining from his eyes. By the way, the actor who played Knock did a great job dying there. Yeah, like a, a slow death. death like just yeah. like because he's all wide eyed and like fuck I did not see that coming. Yeah. I'm like weren't you watching earlier? Man, that commercial <laughs> clearly pointed it's, that he was going to get that fucking table. It's the coffee table of foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. Of course he's going to buy it. <laughs> um, That's one of my favorite deaths in the you know, besides uh, Joey's just because of like how shocked he is. Yeah. When he's like just like oh fuck yeah it's pretty satisfying when you you know after you hear him talking about how he's gonna burn jordan alive right um we the police are there everyone's canvassing frank has come back of course he has he has jordan uh they're and, sitting on the couch together while paul's being yeah. questioned in the kitchen pretty that, typical cop thing. yeah and that is our final clip so you're saying you got both the cut in your hand that's almost healed and the shot in the shoulder 
tonight? That's your story? That's what happened. It's my story. Hmm. And the paperwork for the pistols and the rifle? You can call Jolly Roger Sporting Goods. Ask for Bethany. And you bought these guns? The day my daughter came home. Just in case something like this ever happened again. What about a Glock? I had one for a while. I decided to get rid of it. Gone for good? Yeah, gone for good. Well, I got everything I need. Seems pretty straightforward. Knox came back because he thought Jordan could ID him, and you defended your family like any man would. Thank you. And Dr. Kersby, stick to saving lives. You're good at it. I will. Thanks for everything. So, you satisfied? No. No, I'm satisfied. <laughs> Motherfucker got his pizza, man. Broke his diet. Because throughout the whole movie, he's eating all these health foods, and, and like it's all gross and, and yeah. shit. Yeah. He finally gets a piece of pizza, and he's like, now I'm satisfied. Like, Fucking love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dean Norris rocks it. Yeah. Oh, my God. It was a, there, that was great. And uh, we, so obviously, all swept under the rug. Yeah, this is the point where it's another one of those ultra right-wing fantasy of yeah. you're defending your family. The cops oh, are yeah. going to give you a pass. Dude, a, a, every ultra right-wing person probably jerks himself off thinking about this scenario yeah probably oh my god yeah but i've actually listened to people talk about like like some people who i've known in my life not exactly friends but like friends of friends who you're talking to and they like they'll get super drunk they go dude i always just fantasize about somebody trying to break into my house and get my family i go you really fantasize about that that's a weird fucking thing to fantasize about you <laughs> fucking weirdo yeah <laughs> but anyway we come to um a few months later yep and they are in new york city we are uh another new clip it's Shay again saying hey you know where are you at Reaper you know we haven't heard any news about the Reaper for a while so obviously the Reaper has gone away wherever you're uh, gone stay yeah, there or yeah, something like yeah, that yeah something like that you stay there we're fine and he's dropping off uh, Jordan at NYU and she's like you know he's getting her set and of course like a parent he doesn't want to leave he's like it's time for you to leave now dad he goes alright 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 just remember I'm only three train stops away or yeah, something like yeah. that she goes I know and he leaves and as he's uh, walking across he um, there's a outside of hotel uh uh, while well, they're getting their uh, uh, valets getting the bellboys getting the bags and some guy walks by and just snatches one of the bags yep. and as he's running we hear a hey and then Paul Kersey points his finger in a gun motion at the guy end movie roll credits <laughs> All right. Fucking A. <laughs> it's, you know what? It's not a bad movie. I No, it's not. It's not I was horrible. going into it for a redo. Yeah. I, I never have high aspirations for redos. Yeah. But fuck, if this didn't... I don't remember around. There's some things, and of course... There's some, some legitimate problems, but yeah. it's not enough to drag down the overall enjoyment of the film. It's I enjoyed the film. Yeah. I enjoyed an Eli Roth film. I was shocked at how much I actually liked the movie. Like, I was almost angry at myself, where I'm like, no. <laughs> no, fuck you. I'm not... In, why are you enjoy this stop having a good time yeah you can't like this willis is terrible in this scene why are you liking this stop it yeah there's some editing choices that yeah. were bad there's some acting choices that bruce willis did that were clearly him Phone phoning in. it in and not caring what saves this film for me is this supporting cast is incredible and does an amazing job yeah like particularly dean norris and vincent but d'onofrio they, they those two guys carry this movie yeah, for everybody they hit else. it out of the park those two yeah yeah they fucking kick ass yeah they're the two points that everybody yeah. else is suspending everything on. Yeah, exactly. Because they're carrying the film and Willis is just kind of bouncing around and back Willis and forth. Willis has enough he, Willis gave enough of a shit to make it not half bad. At least in certain points, yeah. yeah. And the violence is amazing. The violence is great. Yeah. Uh, in, in, I don't want to say like believable but at least not like hyper plausible. Plausible. Like, you know, Kersey isn't all of a sudden like able to walk on walls and fucking do flips and shit or or because he was a scrapper now not, all of a sudden he knows yeah. how, how to He's do not kung John Wick, he's just yeah. a guy who eventually learns how to get into gun yeah. battle and, and yeah. learns his way through it and, yeah. and YouTubes his way and to it. And they did a nice enough job of showing him learning. Yeah, you, know, you can say whatever you want about having a montage in a Death Wish movie to ACDC, but at least it shows you how he learned. Yeah. Why he's such a good shot, yeah. you know, because he, he took time. He he's practiced. not, it's just not like, oh, I've always been a childhood uh, shootist then I'm incredible. Yeah, uh, Here's well, a gun. kind of in the original Death Wish is like, I've always been around guns and I'm always a great shooter. You know, it's... I I was just a conscientious objector because my mother raised me after my father died. At least, though, even I'll say that, those leads explained. Like, you did learn how to shoot. So it's something maybe that doesn't go away, you know? Yeah. So, but all all in all, I enjoyed this movie. I thoroughly did. I thought it was was a well-done job. I, yes, I'll say it right here, right now. I enjoyed an Eli Roth movie. (laughs) 
That's great. And it's it's clear because we talked about it so much that we actually went way over. We don't even have time for news no, now. No time for news, man. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> I knew we were going to talk a lot about this. That's yeah. why I didn't even have a news story ready to go because I knew this was going to be a long show. Because I was going to have a lot to say. Which is why we did it on an afternoon and not an evening. Exactly. So we're not rushing to get it we're, over with. Yeah, so I don't have to go home at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Although you still might be going home at midnight. Yeah. Oh, what are we doing now? Uh, we're going to take a little break here. We're going to play a promo for another podcast. Drugs. We'll have a little bit of music and we'll Dr- close out the show. Drugs. <laughs> We're closing out the show. Oh, okay. Throughout the history of the horror genre, there have been those that say horror is for the weak-minded. We, here at the Little Pot of Horrors, do not take kindly to such derisive inference. We are the bastions of tact, good taste, and highbrow horror discussion. Look no further discerning listener, for here, the world of modern horror is discussed with reverence, respect, and similitude of decorum. Stop being such a bitch! <laughs> hey everybody, this is Tim Dorn and you are listening to The Little Pod of Horrors. Even the people who hate horror love to talk about horror because they love to talk about how much they don't like horror. I don't know. Do you want me to Google horror movie ghost in the attic? Hi, I'm Nacho Vigalondo, director of Time Crimes and Open Windows and you know what, I'm listening to The Little Pod of Horrors. Seriously, though, join us for festival reviews, interviews, and guest spots from fellow beloved broadcasters. <laughs> See? I told you I'd get <laughs> <it> up. <laughs> My name's Gareth Evans. You're listening to The Little Pot of Horrors. By sexualized horror, do you mean horror? No. <laughs> No, exactly. I'm going to bleep that now. <laughs> Hello, this is number one New York Times bestselling horror author Scott Ziegler, and you are listening to The Little Pod of Horrors, which does for podcasting what Chucky does for daycare. The Little Pod of Horrors. The best idea since premarital sex on Halloween. Come find us on simplysyndicated.com and on iTunes. If you dare. Yeah, the reason that it's fitting is Bruce Willis is acting. He's like sleepwalking through it. He was sleepwalking through it, yeah. (laughs) All right, let's get the show housekeeping out of the way so we can close out this show. Fucking A. We still need some equipment to be fixed up and or looking to actually add some things to replace it. We haven't had anybody buy anything since the initial outcrop of people purchasing stuff from the store, so... Seriously, guys, uh, the flux capacitor is about to break down and we're going to have a nuclear cascade event. (laughs) You need to support the show. Well, you support the show. Go to our Teespring store, teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash cinema dash psyops you can also find our main landing page slash launching page for all of our shows legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops we have our facebook group where you and all of your friends can join in the fun with the faux photography weirdo posting news stories of crazy shit that's happening around the world and well photos of people that you think are hot i guess I've yeah i've had a few of those some shit and that fucking person playing a french horn into somebody's ass popped up again in our group did it yeah yeah, it's like the second time in about, what, a year, maybe six months max? Somebody likes that. Yeah, it's fucking funny. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's a weird album cover. but That, that is someone's fetish. <laughs> Let it happen. It fits our group. It's yes, weird. Definitely, yeah. It's weird, and it makes reference to what marijuanas will do to you if you you consume them. So there you go. And also, it gives someone an erection. So yes, <laughs> that is exactly what our, our group is about. That someone is you. Well, I kind of always have one, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> that's just a problem with that's, your fucking heart rate. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's our Cinema PsyOps Facebook group. You can find me on Facebook. I am Court PsyOps. You can find Matt on Facebook. He is Matt PsyOp. You can email feedback to Matt, PsyOpMatt at gmail.com. Let him know that he mispronounced footage once again. Did I? Yeah. Footage. Footage. <laughs> footage. Email feedback to Court. Let him know that it's time to take the deal that as long as street fighting can have honor, there can also be anarchies run by him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cinema PsyOps Court at gmail.com. You can tweet a couple of tweets to a couple of twats. I'm at court underscore psyop and he is at psyop Matt. Send us your photos of your favorite sequence in any Death Wish movie. Minus the rapes. We don't need yeah, that shit. We don't need that shit, man. Yeah. Don't put that evil on me. Try and keep it to the kills or at least some kind of weird mugging for the camera that either Willis or Bronson has done. Yes. <laughs> Something like that. And while you're out there mugging for your own cameras and your selfies, <laughs> folks, kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch. <laughs> Do you even have a daughter on the field? No, I just enjoy sport. <laughs> I'm just really into underage girl soccer. <laughs> Clip. Clip. <laughs> That's so funny. I thought about saying yeah. something like that. I'm like, whoop, no, I'm going to change that to sport. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't need that out there. I got enough. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I never get into this, but mom's name is Lucy. Daughter's uh -huh. name is Jordan. So. <laughs> mom's uh, name is Elizabeth Shue. Daughter's <laughs> name is Jordan. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, that could be it. Mom's name is uh, uh, Babysitter. And <laughs> the ba the Babysitter. Well, and no, it's, it's clearly Elizabeth Shue met a nice doctor and married him after yeah, her yeah, acting career. There you go. <laughs> Court just, you know, is a pessimist. I really am. Yeah. The, the glass is always half empty. Even when it's full. He's like, it's still going to be empty soon. <laughs> What's the point in filling it up? I'm just going to drink it all down again. <laughs> now you're making me sound like Eeyore. Yeah, right? Hey, everybody. I'm here. Not that anyone cares. I do a better Eeyore than you. Yeah. Well, you are Eeyore. <laughs> <laughs> just for that, I'm not doing the impression, and you can do the notes. Aw. Yeah, but Eli Roth can't pull that off. No, no. Eli Roth <laughs> Piece of shit. So anyway. <laughs> oh, no, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I may not like him, but. Uh, he's probably not a piece of shit. Yeah. He's shit. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I know. Next thing you know, he's going to put me in a hostile movie and that'll teach me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. You'll get paid to be in a movie. How you will learn your lesson. <laughs> no, he won't pay me. <laughs> I don't think he pays any of the other actors. So. God what damn. is your hatred of Eli Roth? I don't know, man. I just don't like any of his shit. I just don't. I don't like him. He's done a few good things. Okay. Yeah, a few. A few. Yeah. I don't know, man. For some reason, I just don't like him. <laughs> he looks like the ass end of a dolphin. <laughs> I'm going to use all of this. Uh, good, that's it's fine. It's not going away. I don't think Eli Roth listens. I think Eli Roth has a better things to do than listen to this show. I disagree. <laughs> I think no one has anything better to do than listen to this show. <laughs> Eli Roth is just Googling himself. <laughs> Where have I mentioned? That's Eli Roth's that, taste. That that's what he does. Twice a piece of <laughs> Wow, you really fucking hate Eli I Roth. I do not like Eli Roth. Note to self, <laughs> add all, all Eli the... Roth films to year four. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no more porn. Now it's just Eli Roth. <laughs> we're not doing porn. We're doing sexploitation. Sexploitation. Yes, of course. Kinda. Not really a difference. But I mean, a difference. It's kinda. She I, steals I that fucking scene. I'm man. a witness to a crime, but I'm sort of disinterested in talking to you already. Yeah. Like you could tell, like this character, not the actress herself, but the yeah. character would give really unenthusiastic hand jobs. <laughs> 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 Now I'm picturing it, too. <laughs> just rolling her eyes. Uh, just with her boyfriend. Just like, if this will make you shut up for about 30 minutes, that would be great. <laughs> so pretty much every lady yeah, is yeah. trying to fucking get a guy to shut up and go away. Uh, it's the same reason why guys give uh, women diamond. You know? <laughs> it's a family guy joke. Diamond. She'll pretty much have to. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, well, that's a family guy joke. Of <laughs> course. <laughs> that's not me. Uh, <laughs> and it's still you. It's, it's me. Should you be able to just go out and start shooting people on your own? Yes. Holy shit, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is where I would make a really weird detective. I, I'm sorry, that was real honesty there. I, I don't really know where to go from here. Listen, I'm going to get a cup of coffee, and we'll pick this up later. Now, do I think everyone should be able just to go out and kill? No. But, but should I? Yes. Oh, oh, see, yeah. No, see, that's not right. You asked me personally, should oh. I be able just to go out and shoot whoever I want? Do you think anybody should be able to go out and shoot who they want? No. Okay. Now ask me again if I feel I should. I already know that answer. 
answer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. This is how you start running anarchies. Th- th- you do not run anarchy. God, fucking shit. We're not talking about this. Plus, there's no honor in street fighting. There, there, there is honor in street fighting if you can run anarchy. That's the that's the <laughs> trope. <laughs> You have to admit to one to get the other. When I run anarchies, I will make sure there is honor in street fighting. Ooh, I'm conflicted. <laughs> <laughs> it's been reversed on to me now. That little laugh is almost like he's about to go, fuck off, bitch. <laughs> Bruce fucking Willis. Yeah. And maybe he's laughing at the director telling him to do more. Yeah. <laughs> he's just possibly. like, dear Eli Roth, fuck off. I'm only doing this as a favor to Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, pretty much. Something like that. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino, for some reason, loves your fucking feet. So now I have to be in this fucking movie. Clip? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> just makes Quentin Tarantino look like a freak. I'm okay with that. Yeah, me too. Because he is. I mean, dude's in defeat. Watch yeah. his movies again. Yeah, he's in defeat. Big time in defeat. Yeah. Really in defeat. There's some really uncomfortable shit in Jackie Brown now that you know that, where he's yeah. got shots of Robert De Niro staring at Bridget Fonda's feet. Oh, Jesus. Like for an inordinately long amount of yes. time. Yes. Oh, my God. It's really fucking creepy to watch it again knowing that. Huh. <laughs> yeah. I just keep going back to From Dust Till Dawn. Oh, yeah. The thing with Thelma uh, Hayek. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Man, don't get me wrong. Selma Hayek is like my number one. Like you know, everybody has the top. Your five. celebrity crush. The, the the top five people who you know you could sleep with, and it's not technically cheating because it's famous. Your list. Selma Hayek has it forever has been for the longest time my number one. <laughs> but even I, I'm just I'm not a feet person, dude. And so every time I watch that scene, I'm always like, gross. <laughs> that is such a fucking weird way to get alcohol into your system, Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> if Matt doesn't approve, then you know you're going too far. <laughs> You've got too far because I'll do anything to get alcohol into my system. Literally. <laughs> You'll butt Chuck Zima. 